All right, we are here at the U.S. Naval Institute on the Naval Academy grounds, and I am honored and very pleased to be joined by the 17th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. Admiral, thanks for joining us. It's good to be with you. So first, in full disclosure, you and I have known each other for nearly 30 years. If I remember correctly, we were introduced by then Captain Boomer Stuffel Beam. Mm -hmm. I think it was in Rosie Roads. Does that sound right? We were down in Rosie Roads? That sounds about right. I want to say that was 96, 97 time frame. Yeah. So we'll get to the details of our time together where I worked for you when you were GW Bat Group, what we used to call a battle group, now call a strike group. But let's go way back. So you grew up in Hollywood, the unlikeliest of military starting points. Now, if I have this correct, your mom worked for the comedian Jimmy Durante, and your dad was an agent. So talk to us about that upbringing. Uh, I've, I've spent uh, a lot of my adult life uh, making sure that my dad was identified as a publicist. Oh, well, he wasn't an agent. He, he was, was a publicist. Agent, okay, so, okay. And he would roll over in his grave if someone thought he were an agent. Uh, yeah, I, we grew up in Hollywood. Actually, the, the city I grew up in was North Hollywood or Studio City, and Studio City named for all the studios that were there then and actually uh, th that are still in the area. Um, I was the oldest of five kids. Uh, my parents were both Depression kids uh, and moved to California uh, when my mother lost her farm in the, uh, in the uh, 40s, um, and she and two of her sisters and her mom and dad moved to Southern California, she to find her dreams. And my dad lost his mom uh, when he was 17, lost his dad when he was eight. So put himself through college uh, uh, out of Chicago. I went to University of Illinois, uh, didn't have any money, basically worked the whole time uh, and uh, made a call. He was a journalism major, made a call to Southern California uh, to take a possible job. This is in 1940s. Um, and accepted the job, uh, which was with Gene Autry, you know, on the road in the 1940s. And he was a big-time star back in that time frame. So he started in the business that way, and eventually, uh, my dad flirted a little bit with uh, wanting to be an actor, but eventually got into publicity. Uh, he was, he actually did that initially for Autry, and then transitioned over time in the 50s and in the 60s, to be a very, very successful publicist with what we call, you know, a, an A-list group of clients. He had uh, Steve McQueen when he came out for Wanted, Dead or, or Alive, which was a very famous black and white TV show. He had uh, Richard Boone for a show called Paladin. He had the entire Gunsmoke show uh, all, and, and uh, each of the actors that were associated with that. He, had uh, Julie Andrews was a client of his, and Margaret was a client of his. He ran the campaign for the Academy Award for for Charlie and Cliff Robertson actually won Best Actor uh, for that particular year, which when you look back at that year, it was a pretty competitive year. He did not serve in World War II. He was medically not qualified to do that. My uncles did, uh, so and uh, almost every father in my neighborhood had served in World War II, but it wasn't when I was a kid. It wasn't uh, something I focused on. I just knew about that uh, as I was growing up. I was fortunate. I went to a, you know, a very small parochial school, Catholic school called St. Charles uh, in North Hollywood, and then I went to a high school, Notre Dame High School, uh, which that back then was an all-boys high school. Now, I loved sports. Uh, I played baseball and basketball when I was a kid, uh, up through Babe Ruth uh, League uh, in baseball, but my real passion was basketball. And then my uh, senior year in high school, uh, I had a buddy of mine that had come to the Naval Academy, come to Annapolis the year before to play football. Uh, and that was the year Staubach had won the Heisman Trophy. And I had I knew about that. I didn't know much about it, but I knew about Staubach. And, and, and this guy's uh, father, his name was John Gregory, who was a Beverly Hills cop, uh, basically having watched his son, Mike, go through all this, he came to me and said, this is something that you really ought to think about. And so while I was looking at where I was going to go to college, and back in those days, we didn't travel much. Uh, I actually did have a full scholarship 
uh, which wasn't a lot of money back then, to the University of California, Santa Barbara, to play basketball. And it was a good basketball program. Uh, and I started looking at the Naval Academy, uh, and I was attracted to it. I had this hankering as a kid to go east to go to school. Still can't explain it, I just had it. Bill Bradley was the best basketball player in the country back then. He was a rising senior at Princeton. Uh, I wanted to go east. I loved Bradley. I loved basketball. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to go to Princeton, and I certainly wasn't going to play basketball there. Uh, but the Naval Academy came uh, by and recruited me to play basketball. So I ended up uh, making the decision, and I was all of 17, uh, to, to go to Annapolis. And, you know, I was the oldest of five kids. We didn't have a lot of money. My dad said to me, if you want to get a good education, you better get somebody to pay for it. So that was a motivator. And in my 17-year-old mind, uh, basically, uh, my decision was I could go to the Naval Academy for two years without any obligated service, w which is the same as it is today, uh, and then come back and go to a UCLA or some school in Southern California. Uh, obviously, that 17-year-old mind's plan didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> so had you ever been to Annapolis when you showed up for Plebe Summer? No. I, 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 I was the same way. I'd never been here. Yeah, no. And in hindsight, doesn't that seem like a huge leap of faith? It is a huge leap of faith. It's so different now. I mean, uh, I mean, I, one of the things I do now is I teach a group of firsties and have, this is the fifth year I've taught. And when you go through at the beginning of class, beginning of semester, kind of, how'd you get here? What were you thinking about? And most of them, if not every single one of them, had traveled here. I'd been on a plane uh, I hadn't been on a plane, actually. I I'd, I'd, uh, traveled out of California one time when I was like eight, uh, back to the Midwest where we saw my mom's farm and her relatives, and we went to Chicago to see my dad's relatives. Other than that, uh, I hadn't been out of California. I didn't even travel to UCSB in Santa Barbara from where I lived uh, with respect to whether I'd go there or not. Um, uh, and so I got on a plane June 30th, uh, ironically, I got my appointment through the NAAA, uh, and, and I know the system here well enough to understand how this works now, from Dan Roskinkowski out of Chicago. And my dad being from Chicago, there was sort of a, s sort of a symmetry there, uh, if you will. The first time I saw the place, I flew in here, and again, Southern California, I hadn't seen a, a day of humidity in my life. I flew in here on the 30th of June. It was 90 degrees, 95 percent humidity, and I got off the plane. I said, "You mean people actually live <laughs> in this kind of weather?" But the other thing that happened that day is I met my classmates, um, uh, and they are an extraordinary group of. They were all. They still are all men back then because women had not started at the Naval Academy, and uh, they were kids from all over the country, and sort of the, the country just sort of opened up right in front of me. Having come from a you know, small part of L.A., you know, my, the, the radius of my life was, was fairly limited, and all of a sudden, boom, I, see, I meet kids from uh, the south, from the northwest, the northeast, uh, the Midwest, I mean, all, and, it's, and they're different, and they have different backgrounds, and it was all pretty exciting. So the country opened up, and these were the best friends of my life. To this day, uh, they remain the best friends of my life. So I sensed it was something a lot more than I understood when I showed up here. So you mentioned that your dad kind of gave you a ultimatum, wherever you go, it has to be either free or cheap. But they travel in Hollywood circles, right? I mean, you, you named some A-list, Anne Margaret, Stephen yeah. Queen. So you get here, it's the summer of, let me do the math, 64? Right. The Beatles have happened. Vietnam is not quite a national problem yet, right? right? So this happens kind of during your time as a mid, you know, the LBJ into Nixon kind of thing. Right. So did your parents have any concerns about the military part of going to the Naval Academy? Well, they didn't have, as I said, my dad didn't have the background. But my mom would say that I, you know, from the time she could remember, I always made decisions beyond my age for, for whatever reason. Uh, again, hard to pin down. Um, uh, and I've seen that even in my own family with my own kids uh, when it happens. So, uh, so it was a, you know, it was a big leap of faith. You're exactly right. All I knew, there was a show called Men of Annapolis, uh, you know, black and white show in the, in the 50s. Uh, about, that's about all I knew. 
I mean, obviously it would be discipline, there would be structure, you know, all those kinds of things. But I didn't anticipate it would be as good as it was, and I didn't anticipate it would be as hard as it was uh, for, for me. Uh, yet making that decision obviously changed my life forever. Again, to talk about life as a mid with the backdrop of social strife, primarily as a function of the Vietnam War, maybe what I'm thinking of, because I, I have heard stories of sit-ins on the superintendent's lawn and things like this. I think that must have happened after you graduated? I think it was the class of 70 that Okay, that, yeah. Who famously said, as you know, all of us who graduate from here, one of the themes that goes around your class is they can't fry us all. Right. Yeah. And so 70 actually, as I understand it, I wasn't here, uh, had a protest uh, about something, probably liberty. Uh, <laughs> Not the war. Constant, <laughs> yeah. You know, that constant throttle valve that the soup and the commandant can, 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 you to, uh, can use. Uh, uh, and, you know, the thought was you can't fry us all. Well, they all got, it was in front of the commandant's, uh, uh, I think it was commandant's quarters. Uh, and they thought okay. they, they couldn't all be fried, and the commandant fried all of them. <laughs> um, but that time frame, we were really cocooned off here. I mean, the, particularly, I mean, as plebes, you read the Washington Post. You had, to, as I recall, be able to talk about five articles. You had to read the comics and the sports, you know. And then you had, in your plebe rates, you had to regurgitate some of what you'd seen in the paper. But it was a pretty closed-off group, even through those four years. And I don't have to tell you what a significant year 1968 was, which is the year I graduated. Um, but we were, we were pretty closed off, not immune to what was going on in the country, uh, more towards when I graduated than certainly, uh, you know, when I got here. Vietnam wasn't, was, wasn't even a discussion. You know, when I showed up, it was, pr it was really, for me, second class year that Vietnam uh, kind of exploded. Uh, and what happened was I went to a, uh, uh, I went to visit a friend of mine from uh, my childhood who was a couple years older than I was. I'd played baseball with him, who was up at Cornell uh, uh, with his wife. And he was a post-grad at this point, and his wife was an undergrad. And I went up there over spring break to see them. And it turns out Dean Rusk had been invited, who was a secretary of state, had been invited. This is spring of 60. Six, or spring of 67. Rusk had been invited because his son was a student there. And, uh, and uh, this guy whose name was Dave Smith said, you want to go over and see him? I said, sure. So we go over in the evening, about an hour before uh, he's due to appear, uh, or they're, they're going to open, and it is hot. I mean, it, there are tempers flying, and it's sort of, I divide it into the, those with very short hair like me and others with very long hair who were clearly protesting the war. We go in, my recollection was it said about 2,000 people. And, uh, and, and as soon as the president, who was very, of Cornell, who was very clearly against the war, introduced Rusk, they marched 13 women in full black mourning uh, uh, gowns into uh, the uh, auditorium to sit in this front row. Uh, and when Russ got introduced and we sat down, half the audience reaches below their seat and pull out skeleton masks. And I, at that point, go, holy crap, what's going on here? And Rusk wasn't two sentences into his discussion where somebody started, you know, stood up and started yelling at him. So that, and, and then it turned out that weekend was the same weekend that McGeorge Bundy who was Johnson's national security advisor, got kicked off the stage out west, I think out at Berkeley, got booed off the stage there. That was my junior year here, my second class year. That really got my attention. And then the following year, just before graduation, I mean, Martin Luther King was killed April before I graduated. Bobby Kennedy was killed literally the early in the morning of the day I graduated. I had met Deborah, who's my wife, but I had met her. We'd gone to the Army-Navy game in 67, and that's, that was our first date. And then we were dating in the spring, uh, and in May, uh, I couldn't go to D.C. because D.C. was burning, locked down by the National Guard. Baltimore was the same way, so there were riots. So that was, that was kind of the first exposure to Vietnam, and obviously in retrospect, 1968 was a 
was a, uh, a challenging year for the country. That summer, the Democratic Convention, the riots in Chicago, Mayor Daley, who was putting down American citizens with force, and then that rolled on to certainly significant additional demonstrations over time against the Vietnam War. So that was kind of the beginning of my situational awareness for what was going on. And of course, there were graduates out of 65 who were firsties when I was a plebe, 66 and 67, that you heard about, particularly in the Marine Corps, that were on their way. And then I had classmates who couldn't get to Quantico quick enough to get to the first TBS class. John McKay was one example, uh, and get to Vietnam as fast as they could. And one of my best friends in life, classmate, is a guy named Teddy Vivalacqua. Teddy was from Southern California. The only other time I traveled when I was uh, in high school was I took a train up to Sacramento to go to California Boy State, and I met Teddy on that uh, at Boy State, and he was in my league. He was a football player in the Catholic League that I played sports in. I was basketball. So we got to know each other. And then over the course of four years here, uh, stayed you know pretty close. And, and Teddy, sadly, uh, he went right away, and he was killed within a year. Uh, that was the first uh, KIA you know, death of a close friend associated with Vietnam. So that was starting to happen uh, as well. Class 68, a number of notable classmates. When you mentioned Marines, Two names come to the fore, Oliver North yeah. and Jim Webb. Yeah. Uh, did, did you know them as mids? I didn't. Uh, when I grew up, uh, you know, way back when I mentioned I was a sports guy, I loved boxing. I just loved to watch it. So uh, um, I paid a lot of attention to the brigade boxing champ finals championships here. Uh, and, you know, one of the fun events... Uh, while I was here as a mid, was to go see North and Webb fight uh, in that what has become a very famous fight. And and Jim was a decent boxer. Uh, Ollie was just a tough young kid. <laughs> you know, he he would probably object to this, but he was a mauler basically. And <laughs> uh, and you, if you go back and look at that fight, and and Ollie beat him. So I didn't know Jim because he was in the other regiment. And if you go here, you, you're Again, it's back to that radius. Your radius is your company, your battalion, maybe the battalion next to you. Uh, but, you know, the I was in the first, my last two years, I was in the first battalion. So first battalion, second battalion. Ollie was in the second battalion. Actually, he re lived right down the passageway from me when I was a second class and a first class. So I knew Ollie a little bit. I didn't know him well. Uh, you know, beyond that radius, the other regiment, you know, the 4th, 5th, and 6th Battalion, even the 3rd Battalion, which is out in Wing 7, you know, I, I just didn't know that well. I knew some individuals because I had played basketball, and that's one of the lessons and regrets, quite frankly, for me as a mid, that I didn't do more activities, participate in more activities outside my company to get to know my classmates better at the time. Uh, so, uh, so I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know them. I do know, obviously, I don't know how quickly Jim went. I know Ollie was one of the first ones down at Quantico to get through TBS and to deploy to Vietnam as well. Your service selection was surface warfare. Right. What motivated you to make that choice over aviation subs, the other options we have? Well, like so many of us, I thought I wanted to fly. You know, back then it was F-4 Phantoms. You know, they were, very, they were the most exciting jet in the air. And as even happens today, you know, they, you'd fly, they'd fly Phantom Jets over Tecumseh Court at a formation, and you'd look up and say, I want to do that. I had a terrible second-class cruise, got sick as a dog, you know, flying. So I was certainly putting that in question, though I still wanted to fly. And then in my physical, aviation physical, uh, first-class year, it turns out, while I had very good eyesight, my death perception wasn't there, so I was disqualified. Um, uh, and so my choices and my grades, I was just an okay student here. I tell the students uh, uh, that I teach here, it's amazing what happens because I did this one in my graduate uh, degree world. Uh, when you study, you know, when you study, you actually are able to get good grades. Uh, I was a good enough student here to not have any significant problems, although it was a huge adjustment for me. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but I... Uh, uh, I wasn't a great student, so I wasn't going to be able to go submarines uh, back in, in the days, in, in those days. Um, 
And uh, so in one sense, it was by default, I ended up uh, choosing school. I wasn't, I, I had no desire to go in the Marine Corps. But the other thing that happened was, uh, and they do get a lot of grief around here, even to this day, were YPs. And I went out on the YPs my first class. I think it was, I think it was in the fall. And there was this young lieutenant that let me drive the YP in, and I'm, and it's one of those things that I made a perfect landing. I, it turns out I love driving that little, you know, that little ship, the YP around, and it just really hit me, you know, in first class year. For me, it wasn't the fault. I ended up in a position that I wanted to go do that, uh, and and pick surface warfare, and picked a ship out of Southern California, uh, out of Long Beach. Uh, I wanted to be in the Pacific. Uh, USS Colette, and that was uh, that was my first uh, ship and first assignment. It had it, my first drone, uh, a system called Dash, which was a uh, drone anti-submarine helicopter. Which back then, and I was a nuclear weapons officer on my first ship. We had new torpedoes, uh, uh, but the Dash gave you extended range to look for Soviet submarines then, uh, and you could not only you could basically fly a torpedo out to five or six miles, and if you could detect it uh, some way, then you could drop the torpedo at, a, at significant I mean, that must range. have been pretty high-speed technology well, for it, that it, day, it was, right? That's bleeding know, I, edge. Yeah, you know, it was pretty exciting stuff, actually, flying that, that, that helicopter around. Yeah, now we would call it a drone. It was my first experience with a drone. Now, it was a very troubled program. I don't know what the numbers were, but we lost a lot of them. Uh, over time, uh, and uh, on, on the order of like 50%. So as you think of your various, let's just say, lieutenant sea tours, maybe even 03 sea tours, um, what was your most challenging moment at sea during that era? My first one, you know, I took a destroyer, World War II gunship, basically, uh, destroyer, and it had been it had been stationed in Yokosuka, Japan, for a couple of years, uh, and come back to the West Coast. Went into the shipyard. That's when I picked it up. That's the ship I trained the the helicopter for, to, to fly the helicopter on. And uh, and then a year later, so I get to that ship at the end of 1968. I think the fall of 68, and then a year later we deployed to Vietnam, and we're basically a gunline ship. So. While we, I can still remember, I was a JG at the time. Back then, you made JG in 12 months, which I thought was terrific. And it turns out uh, the reason people were getting promoted so fast is we were pretty short of officers, uh, up, up through 04. Because of the war? Well, I'm not sure it was because of the war. Basically, I think that was certainly part of it. I've come to understand the system a whole lot better since then. Um, but I had classmates that were making 04, Lieutenant Commander, you know, in five years. Uh, and I got right behind that, and it slowed down dramatically as the war wound down. But my first ship was a gunline ship. And, and while we did a fair amount of plane guard at Yankee Station, I can still remember the first morning we showed up on Yankee Station, and there's nothing but aircraft carriers, uh, which was the central station uh, where uh, U.S. aircraft carriers uh, flew to support uh, flight operations uh, uh, over Vietnam and in the uh, and in the uh, in the Gulf in, in South China Sea for that war, um, uh, and and it was just one of those. It was a peaceful peaceful in the sense that quiet morning weather wise, and literally the, later that morning the first thing that happened was a uh, one of the one of the carriers dropped a helicopter in the water and we went over. Put our boat in the water, which we'd practice time and time again in preparation for deployment, and and pick the survivors up. Fortunately, we didn't lose anybody, uh, and that was the first. You know, that was sort of boom. It's real. Uh, so we did a fair amount of carrier operations, uh, plane guard operations uh, there, but most of the time from September, late September, early October '68. I'm sorry, '69 to. February 7, he was on the gun line, and we had six five-inch guns. Uh, the most challenging part of my life then was getting qualified as a gunnery liaison officer, GLOW, we t in CIC, basically calling the shots, uh, track, you know, cr 
tracking the targets, making sure everything was working so that when the guns were, so the guns would be aligned to provide uh, the kind of fire support that we needed for, this is up around the DMZ, for the Marines and the Army, uh, the soldiers that were in that. And we spent, uh, we, we just, we shot thousands and thousands of rounds. I mean, to the point <clears throat> where the, the, the five inch uh, guns would literally be glowing red. Uh, and I think we went back and had to rebore it, basically replace replace the barrels certainly once if not twice during that deployment but that's just and, and we would shoot our magazines out go to sea uh, you know go out to sea rearm fill up the magazines and come back uh, uh, to to continue that support in addition and this goes to the dash story you know I was flying dash but uh, I also flew a version of dash which was black at night had a optical sight uh, and we would transfer it and it had bigger gas tanks and I would we would transfer it to the shore forces uh, and they would fly it uh, over to the western side of Vietnam on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That was an adaptation uh, of the DASH system that we used during the war and I tell I mean yes drones are hot right now it's you know it's 2023 I get all that and the world changed for me in 2003 when I saw the first drone kill of a terrorist uh, coming off a, a Reaper as I recall uh, and I knew warfare had changed but ironically I've been flying drones since I was flying yeah. them in 1969. I, I would have never known that. Yeah. That's, that is yeah. high-speed tech. Yeah. So I, I mentioned three tours. So I had, uh, I had another tour. I went into something called the, the uh, Mod Squad. Uh, that Admiral Zumalt in 1970 put together, and I was a weapons officer and operations officer out of Norfolk, and we deployed to the Med in 1971. Then I took command as a lieutenant, uh, ended my career quickly because uh, in what has become a reasonably famous story, after my first sea detail in command, I had a command of a, uh, an auxiliary gasoline tanker, USS Noxubi AOG-56. As a lieutenant? As a lieutenant. Okay. So I'm 26. I've got a crew of about 100. Was that normal? Uh, were all well, were there lieutenants were lieutenant in command commands. of that class? There, there were lieutenant okay. commands. There were only three AOGs. The hot lieutenant command back then were these patrol gunboats, which okay. were used in market time off Vietnam. You mean like, like Apocalypse Now type of thing? No, they were bigger than that, oh. bigger than Apoc Apocalypse Now. I think the gunboats probably were 100, 150 feet, okay. you know, not a big crew, crew of 20, 25, something like that. But everybody, that was sort of the F4 in the, okay. in the surface community. Right. Uh, I, I didn't get picked, I didn't get slated to that. Uh, I got what we call, you know, a fat ship. Uh, the, a yeah, fat ship? That's what, you know, well, okay. that's what, that's what the, the service force uh, those ships were big ship, and they carry the stores. Whether it was fuel or ammo or uh, other or food, that's how we replenished. And so there were only three of us: uh, two in Norfolk and one in uh, in Charleston. And we rotated out of the in one and three ro rotation to the Mediterranean. We had fifty thousand gallons of MoGas uh, that were designed to support Marines if they went ashore. Basically, that was kind of the reason for being. We had about 700,000 gallons or so of the first time I deployed on Noxubi, which was 73, um, uh, of black oil, uh, NSFO, uh, um, which a lot of the, particularly destroyers, but a lot of the ships needed. Uh, and then the second deployment, we'd switched over to diesel fuel marine. So we had three quarters of a million gallons of gas, uh, of oil, if you will. For, to unwrap the fleet, and then this 50,000 gallons of MoGas. Uh, and I was there two and a half years, and my first sea detail coming back after a week at sea, I collided with buoy number 11 in Thimble Shoals Channel, uh, after which... Uh, the what time of day? Middle of the day. Okay. And back to my ship handling. I actually love ship handling. I was decent at it. Uh, and I just missed Judge coming in because there was, a, there was a tug and tow coming out of Little Creek, and I just turned early, and I missed... Uh, and I missed the current, uh, so I ended up uh, uh, colliding with buoy 11. Didn't do any damage to the ship or any damage. Just to a the... glancing blow kind no, of thing? Well, no, I mean, it, I hooked it, uh, oh, so it okay. wasn't a glancing blow. Uh, I got stuck out there, and I needed divers to come out. Uh, 
And there was a new sheriff in town, a two-star by the name of Julian Burke, uh, who was looking for heads to chop off, and so I served myself up early for that. <laughs> and he directed that my boss, who was a squadron commander uh, in Serve Ron A, write a one-day special fitness report on me. And it was a very bad fitness report. I call it, you know, it was an F for failure, for you have no future, for go find something else to do. Uh, which was a pretty quick end to my career at that point. I mean, I was running at the head of the pack, uh, and that obviously set me back. Um, it took me two and a half or three years to get the fitness report removed from my jacket because the, 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 the relationship between reporting senior uh, and uh, individual is sacred. And because my boss had been directed that was actually an illegal order. So I was able to expunge that fitness support from my record. That said, uh, it took me 11 years to recover from that professionally. And when I teach leadership and have for a long time, I talk about that failure. Uh, and it's one of the lessons in my life that I've learned uh, with respect to, uh, it's not about the failure, it's what, what do you do with it? Uh, the other thing is the guy who inspired me to stay in the Navy who was on the USS Blandy uh, which was my second ship and was in, a, in the mod squad, uh, was my mentor. And he knew enough about the system to help me, you know, uh, navigate the system so I could actually apply uh, and, uh, and possibly get this fitness support out of my record. But the fitness support package, if you will, out of that command, two and a half years, and it was one of these things I just got extended. Uh, when I took command, the tours for lieutenants were 12 months, uh, and Naksubi was a was a pirate ship, basically. You know, I, I, it was in really bad shape when I took it, and I had come from destroyers, uh, and so I knew how to run a ship. But my tour got extended because they were going to decommission the ship, 12 months, uh, and then it got extended another six months. So for 30 months, I was in command as a lieutenant, uh, and I loved doing what I was doing. And I made two deployments to the Mediterranean supporting the patrol gunboats who were stationed in Naples, Italy. Uh, and Deb, for those three deployments, the one on Blandy in 71, the one on Naksubi in 73, and the one on Naksubi in 74, Deb traveled around Europe on a Eurail Pass with a buddy. Um, uh, and, you know, and we, had, we didn't have any kids at the time. We had a blast. I would go to sea and then meet her in my next port. I had more of her stuff in my stateroom than I had. <laughs> Uh, than I had mine, but it was, you know, it was one of those things, it was a time of our life. We really did have a great time back then. The fitness support impact from Noxubi and that failure was such that I could not screen to become a company officer at the Naval Academy, uh, and which is what I wanted to do. I'd been at sea for, you know, since I graduated for seven years, uh, and uh, I asked Deb, we'd been married, we were married five years at this point, uh, what would you like to do? We met here in Annapolis. She really wanted to come here. So I said, I didn't know what a good job was or wasn't. So I asked to come back here. I couldn't screen. Uh, it's the first time my, my squadron commander who knew me uh, knew the head detailer uh, and uh, a guy named John Adams. Uh, and Adams took a chance, quote unquote, on me and, and essentially sent me down here as a company officer. So that's how I got here uh, in uh, 1975. So do you think that a lieutenant could survive that incident these days? Because there's a lot of sort of anecdotal stuff about zero defect Navy. Do, do you think that had that same thing happened these days, uh, understanding that that was an illegal order, but what's your sense of, of that era versus the way well, things are now? Well, I mean, I, I, and I've been up and down over the years on this zero defect mentality because it's terrible. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I screened, the reason I say 11 years, it was 1973 when it happened. 1984, I met, I'm a commander at the postgraduate school getting my master's degree in operations research for my third look for commander command, which effectively would have... There was a fourth look, nominal fourth look. I think it was like 10% of the group. So effectively, my third look was my last look, and I screened for command for 05. And that's the impact that that fitness report had. And I'd had nothing but great fitness reports, you know, since that time, after I left 
Nak Subban, I broke out, I was number one here. I go back to sea as a chief engineer. Two and a half years, literally, with the exception of the chairman's job, the hardest job I ever had, uh, without any question. Uh, and then screen for command. We go out to Hawaii. Uh, I actually was slated to go to a reserve frigate, which would have been the end of my career because reserve frigate COs don't screen for major command, generally speaking. So I was resigned to that because I was a third look screener and, and I thought, you know, that's how I'd end up. Um, they were having trouble on several DDGs with, with 1,200 pound engineering plants. They needed COs who had that background. So I was redirected to USS Goldsboro. And that was a magical tour, uh, deployed to the Gulf. This was 1986, 1987, post Stark, right after Stark uh, got hit there. Uh, came, you know, had a really great tour there. Uh, screened for major command uh, uh, years later. Actually, that's when I, coming out of uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, was sent, didn't, still hadn't come to D.C., was sent to, to Swast to run the, the ensign course there. Up uh, in Newport? Up in Newport, Rhode Island, which was, a, which was a great tour as well. That was sort of my first big step into the community. Uh, uh, if you will, and then uh, screen for command, uh, made, made 06 screen for command, of, and then was slated to USS Yorktown. Um, Yorktown did really well, although I had another major failure there. I failed the OPI, uh, the, the propulsion exam associated with engineering, uh, and in fact drafted my letter of resignation and because CEOs and chief engineers were getting fired right and left. And again, in that failure, I, I delegated too much. I had a junior, I had a really strong engineer, but he was just, he was too young and I gave him too much. Uh, I tend to delegate um, and I just, I, I, I wasn't close enough to it. It was really my fault, not his. Um, but I had a couple mentors, uh, Paul Reason, uh, Doug Katz, and Don Pilling, who was my embarked battle group commander that said, no, you've got a future. You learn these lessons. You may have a, a place for us down the road. So three in my community that actually watched out for me, all of whom became very close friends of mine over time. Then when I left that job in Yorktown, uh, I went to, uh, I, I became the detailer, that same, you know, that guy John Adams, Purse 41, and most of the individuals who go to those head detailer jobs make flag. So it was less about performance in the job than it was assignment to the job. It's not a perfect equation, but that usually works. And so that, again, re-embedded me in my community. Uh, and this is 1992, 1994, sorry. Uh, made flag there, went to the Pentagon to a job for a short period of time, seven, eight, nine months. It was a flag job, but it really wasn't. It was, that was really my first significant job in the Pentagon. Then went to GW Battle Group, uh, which was a great tour for me. So how much did you know about the aircraft carrier in the infinitive going into that job? Not, not a lot, although, and I'm a pretty curious guy, one. Uh, before I uh, went to, to uh, Yorktown, which was an air defense cruiser, I knew a lot about air defense. I mean, I'd grown up on cruisers, guided, guided missile ships, with the exception of the first two or the first three. Uh, uh, and so I spent a lot of time uh, in the, in, not in the aviation world, but certainly in the warfighting world that involved uh, defending aircraft carriers. And I was very familiar with airspace, the kinds of airplanes, you know, uh, aircraft that were in air wings. But that was, uh, and, and, and as a result of that, I weaned, I, I, I managed to, uh, bore my way into uh, Top Gun for a course right after, with nothing but aviators myself, I was headed to Yorktown, I had time, and I was out there for a week or two with nothing but aviators who'd fought in Desert Storm. And that was a real, you know, really significant wake-up week for me. One, to try to learn more about them, but two, how hot the young aviators were because they didn't have the technology they thought they needed. Uh, that, they, that the Air Force had actually in Desert Storm that they saw. Uh, and there were some senior officers there, senior aviators, one stars, 
uh, who are also getting nothing but flack from these young JOs in terms of what needed to happen in the community. So, so that was a that was before Yorktown. I did the Yorktown tour. Uh, so I and then uh, and, and then obviously I get assigned to uh, uh, to GW. The blessing on GW for me was was and this is very much my style is is it gives me an opportunity to learn and grow. So what is this thing called an airway from the inside, not from the outside? Uh, and you mentioned, you know, John Stufflebeam, who was the air wing commander, you know, and he and Yank Rutherford, who was the CEO, uh, CEO of the uh, of GW, were extraordinary in including me in learning, is allowing me to learn as much as I possibly could, you know, in that in that tour, which was about twenty, I think it was twenty months from beginning to end. We had kind of a, I, I'm going to call it an all-star team. Yeah. Certainly big personalities. Yeah. Boomer Stufflebeam, uh, Yank Rutherford, Joe Sestak was the Desron. Yeah, right. right. His chief of staff was yeah. Phil Davidson, right. later Indo-Paycom, classmate of mine. We thought we were going to be sort of doing, not unlike that cruise that you and yeah. Deb, where she's touring the Med, and, yeah. and we thought that's kind of what it was going to be. Yeah. So we pull into Haifa. You and I and Dirt Callahan, and I forget who our fourth was, played golf at the only course in Israel, um, Caesarea. And then uh, you the found 80, out. It was, it was the 82. I don't know. Dirt was 82 or 86. He was VFA 82. So yeah, he was, was, was the CEO. Of, it was 86. Uh, the other. Oh, the other CEO. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, two, two legacy Hornets corners. Yeah. Um, so we are headed back to the ship. Um, Oh, well, before I get to that one, they're, they're, I remember we're in the car, um, and TR and I are moaning about how our classmates are getting ahead of us. Um, and you said, with your very deadpan manner, and this is when Admiral Johnson is the CNO, right? So you're a one star at the time, and he's CNO. And you said, hey, fellas, Jay Johnson's a classmate of mine. How am I doing? <laughs> I just love that line. But we're on our way back to the, to the ship. From after uh, after that round, and you found out in the most unlikely way that we were headed for the Gulf. It wasn't the Sixth Fleet commander that told you, Christian Amanpour. Oh, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> you found out on, on CNN. I don't, that, remember, uh, yeah, I don't remember uh, that. And then, if I remember correctly, Ad Admiral um, Abbott, I think, was, was Sixth yeah, Fleet. Yeah, he was Sixth Fleet. He's like, hey, Mike, you're going to, uh, we're going to have to send you to the Gulf. You're like, I already know. <laughs> I heard from Christian Amanpour. So we sort of through the ditch, the yeah. Suez Canal, wind up uh, in, in the Persian Gulf. I remember another all-star from this tour, your OPSO, Rick Hunt, yeah. later uh, an admiral, said to me, Mooch, we're not going back to the Met. I was like, no, we'll just sort of check the block and do a little bit of Operation Southern Watch, the no-fly zone. And like, no, we're here. So we wound up doing three carrier ops yeah. in the Persian Gulf. My British friends would want Okay, and okay, four. my my mistake. <laughs> four carrier ops. We had to create a carrier box for the the Royal Navy yeah. carrier box four, which was basically in the literals of, you know, Basra. Yeah, my good my good friend Ian Forbes would say, "Yes, you put me in the minefield." Yes, what am I doing? Yes, right? well, because your hair is couldn't go very far. <laughs> but uh, what do you remember about that in terms of the other flags? Because we had may he rest in peace, Black Nathman was the the head guy. Um, of the three, Willie Moore was on Independence. W what do you remember about that whole dynamic? Well, pretty exciting time. So strategically what was going on, we've got four carriers there, uh, is we were coming very close to going to war. This is 19, fall of 19, 1997. We were coming very close to going to war with uh, Iraq. Uh, and, uh, and the drumbeat was clearly there. Um, we did liaison ashore, as you may recall. We had a we, we had a group of uh, a command center ashore, if you will, that, uh, as I recall, the Air Force was running, uh, and we had a significant footprint there from the from the carrier groups uh, to to again make sure uh, that someone knew something about naval aviation and could use the capability. Uh, I can remember, and, and part of me in that, which was one of the great learning experiences. Part of me was I had taken a number of hops, you know, in all the different kinds of aircraft uh, on, uh, you know, in the air wing because I wanted to see what I was asking people. I wanted to understand as much as I could. And I can remember flying, 
in one of the S3s just south of Iraq. Uh, looking down, and it was it was a night. It was a it was a brilliant uh, day weather-wise, and I can just remember looking down into Iraq, wondering if I, you know, if I'd ever see, if I'd ever set foot, you know, in that country. Obviously, uh, that question got answered over the course of my life because of what happened a few years later when the Iraq War started. Secretary Cohen at the time, '97, came out. He was in Saudi. We were struggling whether whether we could actually launch strikes out of Saudi Arabia and then return to Saudi Arabia, just as an example of some of the political aspects of it. Uh, but it was very, very tense. And then we were there over the course. So in the fall, tensions were reduced. Uh, and this was a Southern Watch issue, if you will. Uh, we were trying to contain Hussein uh, and had quite successfully over the course of several years because of Northern Watch and Southern Watch, uh, and we were involved in Southern Watch. But we were doing all the activities you do to get ready to go to war, including the targeting, the weapons packages, uh, the, who were the leaders going to be, uh, you know, all of that. It calmed down over the winter, and then it started heating up again in the spring. And, and what I recall was, uh, was, you know, literally two times, once in the fall, once in the spring, where we... Uh, fall of 97, spring of 98, where we almost went to war with Iraq. Politically, strategically, obviously, we didn't do that. Uh, but it was very intense. That was also what I would call my first email deployment. It's the first time we had email. Tragically, in our air wing, we had one uh, Marine Corps uh, F-18 squadron, and tragically, we lost uh, the XO uh, of, uh, uh, of two... 51. Of 251. The T-Bolts. Yeah. In a, in, a, in a mishap, tragic mishap. And basically, you know, I, we, we shut email down only to find out that the rest of the world had it uh, because we wanted to get the information to the next of kin before she and her family could find out by other means. But the email piece of this started to cut both ways. We, it could be used well, and we were in communications with home, th with home throughout the deployment, but if something tragic happened or if something we wanted to shut down for a, an operation, the signal home was something's going on. That just changed, that moment changed communications for me in a deployed sense, uh, if you will, uh, and certainly was a very operative issue throughout the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for me later on particularly with respect to families. Yeah, that the incident, and I've recounted this on the channel in, in a couple other episodes, was the mid-air mid in the tanker pattern, yeah. uh, which shows you that it's not the war, it's the admin sometimes that is the most yeah. hazardous part. Um, I remember I was in CAG Ops. Your Air Ops officer, T.R. Raines, came in and said, we come come into flag, plot, whatever your yeah. tactical part of the, the your, your space is. And you kept hearing... Eagle, Eagle two hunt two zero one Eagle, um, and and I finally said, I that's T bolt, right? We thought they were saying Eagle, but they were saying T bolt, uh, and they were like, okay, that's one of ours that that is down, yeah. and then Nimitz left, so Admiral Nathman and Nimitz uh, left, and I remember this is my only prowler hop, right? So we took helicopters from GW to Nimitz to do the. Out briefs, turn, turnover yeah. briefs, and and one of our contingency ops demanded five prowlers, EA sixes. We only had four, so we needed to take one of theirs mm -hmm. uh, for for uh, for us. So, flew over in helicopters, do our meetings, and then, Dirt Callahan, the same Hornet skipper that we were talking about before, and I jump into the back of of this EA six, a Nimitz EA six. We had Ice Gamberg, who was our, my strike ops officer, Boomer strike ops officer, and I forget who the pilot was. I think it was the opso of our squadron. Cat shot, 10-minute hop, land back on GW. That's my only prowler hop. Dirt was not at all. As a Hornet pilot in the back of an EA-6, I was like, Dirt, welcome to my life. <laughs> but even then, you couldn't see out the front of an EA-6 at all. You know, So that was pretty sporty. And I remember you were concerned because we were on the step. As you said, we had highs and lows associated with, are we going to war? And so con ops were, were sort of at a fevered pitch ready to go. And then we kind of lose the edge. I remember you flagged that. Yeah. And so we, we had to do sort of, okay, 
bend, don't break, kind of exhale, but stay ready. That's, that's, a, that's a trick, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, because we weren't going anywhere. We knew that. Yeah. It's, it's back to what Rick Hunt said to you. Yes. You know, his sense early on, we're going to be here for a while. And that clearly was the case. And, it, and as tensions eased over the winter, they didn't go away. So the question for leaders is, how do you, how do you keep the edge uh, in a way that is supportive of if you, you know, if you have to go or get back up on the step, you know, it happens with all the training we've done, in effect, going through the first you know, few, the, the first several weeks of the buildup, you don't want to lose all that. So you, leaders, I mean, that's what, that's what squadron commanders in that air wing and, and the ship's as well, get paid to figure out and make sure their troops are... are well, I mean, this is the nature of expeditionary warfare. This yeah. is what the Navy does, yeah. right? We yeah. fight the war between the wars, yeah. right? Yeah. So and you never know. Yeah. The other thing that, that was operative uh, from the day I got to GW uh, and with the air wing was, so this is 96, I think, right? We, I mean, and, and we catch it. I catch the air wing and the GW at a time where you're gonna, I'm going to do full workups, and then we're going to deploy. We're going to make this med deployment. That obviously uh, didn't work out, uh, and then come back. And that was kind of the 20 months. But in 96, what I was also infinitely curious about were the, uh, was the aftermath of tailhook. Uh, and we don't need to – so this is four years later, right? I mean – and I was struck, part, part of my style is, is to learn about who I'm asking to do what. So I spent a lot of time in the ready rooms. And I got a feel pretty quickly for how, uh, how difficult it was for junior officers in the aviation community at the time, post tail hook, because their leaders had not been around for them. And many of their peers uh, had actually been sort of escorted out of the Navy and besmirched because they attended Tailhook without doing anything uh, specifically for which they should have been punished. Uh, and I wanted to understand that from, uh, from a leadership perspective, from an accountability perspective. Uh, and I still teach on that issue tied to the, you know, my belief then, and, and it's even that much more so now, is the, a the senior aviation leadership, the three-star level, you know, didn't uh, put their letters in and take responsibility for what happened there, uh, regardless of their level of participation because it was, it was under their watch. And that's a huge accountability issue, which I carried with me literally for the, I mean, I do today, but literally as a very active issue for senior level accountability uh, uh, throughout the military, uh, which also took great took me to great emphasis during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan when I was CNO uh, and chairman uh, as well. So that was a real eye-opener for me uh, in, in that battle group tour as well. Let's fast forward to uh, your time as CNO. Your change of command was here at Alumni Hall. Right. What did you inherit tone-wise, morale-wise as, as CNO, and how did you set the tone once you took over? So this is 2005. Um, you know, a fun story about that, and you talked about this earlier, about Jay, my classmate Jay Johnson. Uh, and all of us who've grown up in the military, you're always looking around, am I ahead, am I behind, how many, how many of my classmates or contemporaries are deep selected, et cetera. And what I tell when those stories come up, uh, and it's natural, and it happens in every service. Uh, and, uh, and, and Jay, I had two classmates that I, I say took off on day one after we graduated. One was Denny Blair, who was a Rhodes Scholar and eventual four-star, and obviously Jay, who was a CNO. And Jay I knew because he was in my battalion. But we go different ways, and Jay's just a rocket. And when I got picked, I was actually at a four-star job in Europe, um, the, the job in Naples, uh, Italy, which was a NATO job as well as a Navy job. Um, and when I got picked, I got this great email from Jay saying, Here's some thoughts, uh, congratulations, and when you come back, let's get together. We linked back up, uh, and in ways it was as if nothing had changed since we were mid, because it was that kind of friendship, uh, even though he'd moved so far out in front of me. And, w and what I tell young people is, uh, Jay, if, Jay, if I had finished four years as CNO, 
um, and I only finished two because I, I moved into the chairman's job unexpectedly. But if I had finished four years as CNO, I would have only finished nine years behind my classmate, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so there's room for the tortoise and there's room for the hare. Uh, or as actually Denny Blair said recently, you know, he, he, uh, he, he was kind of a sprinter and I was kind of a marathon. Well, guy. we should note that Jay Johnson skipped a star. Was it two or three stars? He, he went from two to four? Yeah, I think he went from one to three. One to three, okay. Yeah, yeah. and there were others uh, who've done that as well, but it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen very often. Deb and I went to Naples. I'd been the vice chief of the Navy for a year. It took, uh, actually, uh, Black Nathman relieved me. Uh, I, I talked about, you know, the first of... That, that time in the Gulf with Nathman was extraordinary. As a warfighter, uh, he was as good as I've ever seen. Um, and, and then we both came back to the Pentagon. He ran the aviation community, I ran the surface community. Um, uh, and then we stayed close as he became a three-star to run Air Forces, uh, and I went to Second Fleet, et cetera. Then, Came back, he relieved me uh, as vice chief, uh, and I go to Naples. And I, I suspect this is it. This is 2004. Uh, for me, I'm going out there for two or three years, and then I'll retire. I get picked to be the CNO, which was a surprise to me, um, uh, and come back to get ready for that. And as I took over, and I had worked for, I got a lot of time for Vern Clark. He was one of my mentors as well. Uh, extraordinarily bright. Uh, he, he had a plan for what it was going to for what was going to happen under his tenure. Now this was under Rumsfeld, Bush. We're going. You know, we're in war in Iraq in 2005, uh, and actually, obviously, uh, Afghanistan is is boiling as well. Um, and uh, and this had all been set up. And this is also part of my story. I got pulled back in as a three-star to relieve Ed Bastiani, who had moved to be EA to Rumsfeld. Uh, and a week later, the, the plane flew in under my office. That was 9-11. And so all of that with backdrop that that's been going on you know, for several years now as I take over as CNO. I know Rick was in the office. Where were you when the plane I hit? was in the CNO's uh, So you were on office. the other side of the building? Well, not the other side of the building. I was 100 feet down the road. I was okay. basically down the passageway, 75, 100 feet. Yeah, Rick Hunt, who was my EA then, and my deputy EA, they turned around. Our offices, those offices are all on the fourth floor. Basically, Rick uh, saw the 757 flying under his feet. And it, it was, you know, it was that quick. Uh, and I knew the world had changed forever, you know, when that happened. Um, so fast forward to four years later, I get picked to be the CNO. I have made my first couple of trips, actually several trips into Iraq, because I had a NATO hat in Naples where we were training the Iraqi uh, um, military uh, and the NATO trainers that did that from the Netherlands and from Germany and from Italy were working for me. It's the first time I met Dave Petraeus because we dual hatted him. He had that mission for Iraq, but he also took it over for the Iraqi military from the NATO perspective as well. So they all worked for him. Uh, and, uh, and, and I would expe I expected to be that some significant issues and challenges in the Balkans at the time, Kosovo in particular. Uh, this was not too long after the war there. The first time I really got embedded deeply in NATO, even though I'd been a NATO guy when I had GW, I was a you know strike group. Uh, for a NATO force in O plans there, I, as Second Fleet, I was the, I was a strike fleet commander, if you will, in wartime uh, uh, for NATO at that point. So I, I wasn't unfamiliar with NATO, but this was the first time I really got involved in what I would call at the political level of NATO, which is notionally a military organization, but it's really political as well. And then I come back, I get picked to be CNO. Uh, Rumsfeld's still sec def. We're obviously in Iraq. It's not going well. So there were two, over the first year or so, there were a couple things. Going on inside the Navy, uh, BRAC had a, was occurring at the time. Uh, this is based, the base realignment um, and... Uh, closures. Closures. Yeah. So yeah. highly, the big part. The highly part. electric uh, yes. and controversial each time we've done it. 
Um, and at the center of that for me was the submarine community because the question was whether New London, Connecticut, which is sort of like Yankee Stadium for the Yankees, New London, Connecticut's sort of home base for the submarine community, and it was close to being on the list. Uh, and uh, Admiral Clark, who was my predecessor, uh, was an ASW expert. Uh, and what I found when I took over was the submarine community really felt alienated from the leadership of the Navy. So I don't know if it was my first visit, but it was pretty close to it. It was the first visit I, I can recall was up to New London. My whole goal of that outreach was to, you know, to uh, embrace the submarine community and do so in a way to make sure they were part of the team. Um, uh, I had reached out and had a good relationship with Skip Bowman, who, was, who had Rickover's old job uh, who, at Naval Reactors. Uh, and, and because Skip had been my boss when I was a detailer, he was CNP at the time. I had a relationship with him which went back, you know, almost a decade. That was a major part of what I found, if you will. The second big piece for me was, uh, was the war in Iraq. This is the joint side. This is the joint chief side. It wasn't going well in 05. It was going worse in 06. And so I spent a fair amount of my time as a joint chief with my classmate, Mike Hagee, who was a commandant of the Marine Corps, and the other chiefs, all of us were really concerned about where the war was going, and we didn't see much of a plan. We couldn't see what the strategy was, and so we started agitating. Pete Pace was the vice chairman, Dick Myers was the chairman. Uh, we started agitating for, well, okay, what are we doing here, and what's our strategy, and how do we fit into that? So those were two of the really big issues that I attacked with respect to being the head of the Navy at the time. It wasn't just as CNO because the Joint Chiefs hat was significant uh, as well. You mentioned in, in, uh, the, the tail hook piece and, and the morale, the sort of reverberations morale-wise as a function of that. Um, so I, I think you were also concerned about um, heavy-handed leadership maybe sadistic leadership is overstating it, and, and you made uh, some significant changes uh, based on that not being okay, oh, obviously. You, you must be speaking of the SESTEC. Issue. Yes, sir, that's who so I'm saying. It's a So it's a good lesson, uh, quite frankly. Joe SESTEC, as we talked about earlier, had been my squadron commander as an 06. He did not, when we went to the Gulf, he stayed in the Mediterranean and essentially became the, I would call it, you know, de facto operational commander did he stay or did you leave him? No, no, he stayed. That, that wasn't no, a choice. Oh, that, that who made that choice? choice? Six uh, Fleet? It was, yeah, I think Six Fleet. Okay. You know, I, I don't remember it as a choice. And he, had, he, as I said, de facto became the operational commander for the whole med as an 06. Extraordinarily talented, bright, capable uh, individual. Um, and I, you know, I got to know him really well. And I was a big supporter uh, of Admiral Sestak and uh, then Captain Sestak. And nobody I ever knew worked harder at any level. Uh, um, and years later, you know, he makes flag uh, and, and uh, comes up uh, and is working for Admiral Clark. Uh, and Clark's very supportive of what he was doing. Uh, and it was sort of one of those sort of behind closed doors. Nobody really knew what was going on. But it was strategic and it was impactful. And it was what the CNO wanted him to do when that was going on. And he's a... He's a frock three star, and what the word that I got, and I was I was living in Italy at the time, was there were a handful of very talented young flag officers who were going to leave because he was driving them out. He was uh, in combination of style and and uh, and and just literally driving. Uh, they were they were done. Uh, that the whole issue of retention, whether it's Enlisted retention, officer retention, flag retention has always been a big deal to me. And it turns out that, you know, Joe's leadership style was what was doing this. I can't tolerate that. Well, the lesson is, I, I, Joe, I was very close to Joe and I didn't see this. Uh, as a leader, I didn't see this. I don't think his leadership style changed a whole lot from the time he was in 06 until he was a flag. Uh, and we all need to be mindful of that. So literally on day one, uh, when I took over CNO, you know, I called Joe in. Uh, Vern's gone, and there, you know, obviously I'm a new, the new CNO, and I tell Joe there's no place for him anymore uh, on my staff. 
uh, et cetera. And he's a frocked three-star at the time, and eventually was, uh, you know, he, he didn't hold that three-star rank. He was never actually promoted, became a two-star. Uh, and it was, I mean, y yes, it was a message that reverberated. Uh, in fact, people still talk to me occasionally about it to this day, a couple of decades later. But it was a natural thing for me to do because it was now, you know, my wardroom and it's what I would tolerate and what I wouldn't tolerate. Uh, we didn't have much of a discussion about it. To his credit, you know, Joe handled it exceptionally well. He left the Navy, went and ran for Congress. He could have exploited our relationship in that he didn't do that. Uh, and he was a guy, I mean, basically in all that, he's, the, he's a Sestak that I knew. Um, what I didn't know was what I didn't know and didn't understand. And once I knew about it, basically I couldn't, I couldn't look away, I wouldn't look away from it. So yes, the, the, you know, the Sestak uh, issue is, is one uh, that's worth recounting. As again, again, we differed on how to get things done. We had a different view, often that, that oftentimes happened. And, and we separated. Uh, you know, at that point, um, and, he, you know, he couldn't have, I don't think he couldn't have handled it any better. Uh, uh, well, let me, let, I, I do want to go back to the women minorities priority for me when you asked when I took over. When I got here at the Naval Academy, to the Naval Academy in 1975, I was on the, one of my collateral duties was on the admissions board. Uh, and that fall, fall of 75, we get a, I call it a telegram, but basically the law changes. And the telegram sort of is uh, Naval Academy, women next year, figure it out. So that was the task to the admissions committee. So I was on the board where we selected the first group of women. I was here as a company officer when they came. The two groups who were the uh, most opposed were the mids uh, and the alumni. I, I was part of a group, actually Jerry Holland, uh, who's, uh, who, who's still around, was the co a battalion officer commander at the time. He and seven of us guys, you know, and one, we had one woman psychologist, I think, with a group of eight that uh, tried to figure out as a task force how to get ready for women next year. And I think if you ask the women, I don't, they're, they're, they wouldn't grade us as having done very well. This was a group of talented guys, but it goes to show you what we didn't know at the time. So my, my support of women in the military started there, and it has just stayed uh, uh, there you know, forever, and it's there to this day. Enormously talented group of people that, uh, and I'm a talent-driven individual, that make organizations better. Um, fast forward to when I'm CNO, uh, and I'd also been very involved, particularly in my community, with the support of uh, minorities, particularly African American, African Americans, and in the time more men than women. Uh, um, so when I was CNO, I had, you know, three top priorities. One of them was people, and in the people side, I literally didn't give a talk on anything without somehow getting to my priority for women and minorities. Uh, uh, and support of diversity in that regard. And I knew the system. I knew what job screened. Uh, I have this philosophy that you learn over boards, which are, the, which are the convenings of how we get selected for promotion and how we get screened for various jobs. But if you just put ducks on the board, you know, ducks are going to pick ducks. So I knew how to change the system. Uh, and also, if you have just ducks in the, in the detailing world, world, whether it's placement, the placement side uh, or the detailing, the assignment side, you're going to get ducks. And you just change that out. Uh, and a year later, there were a lot more, you know, young women and minorities in, uh, in, in hot jobs, flag sec jobs, flag lieutenant jobs, EA jobs, etc. I also picked as CNO the first female uh, executive assistant, Nora Tyson, who was as good an officer as I've ever known. I met her. She was CEO of the Batan. Uh, literally, I went down there uh, when I when I was a. Uh, this is when I obviously when I was CNO, right after Katrina, which happened a month or so after I took over as CNO. And you get a feel, as you know, when you walk on a ship or into a command, you know pretty quickly. You can get a feel for for the atmosphere, for the morale, for all those things. And I'm hugely sensitive to that. And I walked up. Board Batan and 
it was extraordinary and I knew it right away. Uh, so in doing the due diligence, you know, Nora certainly looked like she could do the job and she did a, an incredible job and ended up eventually being a, a, a three star, you know, in the Navy. Uh, and actually my view had four star potential. So Deb and I, we had a sort of a, we had a four year plan. Deb had focused on family since I was uh, in command of sort of the early early to mid 90s. I mean, actually, that's not you know the 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 early to mid 80s when when I was XO of a cruiser uh, USS Starrett out in the Philippines. So she was she was a leader on family issues and and had great concern and passion for taking care of families. We had this four year plan. Uh, as CNO, and it's we're two years in. It's 2006. I mentioned, you know, it's not going well in Iraq. And Bob Gates calls me. Actually, I had Nora Tyson was my EA, and I was away on a trip. And I called Nora, and I said I need to go see Secretary Gates on something. I can't remember what it was. I had an appointment with him on a Thursday afternoon. This is uh, in the spring of 07 uh, to talk about something and. Uh, I go down into it, and, and the facts are that as a service chief, so as a CNO, you don't interact with the Secretary of Defense that much. The vice chairman and chairman interact with them seemingly several times a day, as they do with the White House. Uh, but the joint chiefs don't, and certainly we hadn't much with Rumsfeld. We'd done it a little more with Gates. Gates was much more proactive about being with the service chiefs in the tank. Rumsfeld wouldn't go to the tank. You know, he sort of, that was, in, in my view, one of these uh, false flag issues of civilian control kind of thing. Uh, that never bothered Bob Gates. Um, so, it, but we're not with the secretary very often. So I go in Thursday afternoon to see Bob on whatever I was going to talk about. And the first thing I noticed, uh, he had a really great um, uh, Horseholder, EA, uh, XO, whatever you want to call him, a civilian by the name of uh, Robert Rangel, who'd come from the Hill. The first thing I notice when I go into Gates's office is Rangel's not there. So I'm going, I mean, my antenna goes up, but, but I don't know why. I don't have a clue. There's this little table right next to Secretary of Defense's office, and Gates sort of waves me over to sit down at this table. And he starts talking to me, and about 20 seconds in, I figure out where this is going and and you know one of those sort of movie scenes where you you're you're removed and you can you're kind of hear the yeah, you, you hear the discussion in the background <laughs> and Gates is speaking for a couple of minutes and I'm going holy cow he's gonna he and Bush are gonna ask me to be chairman and then I could tell he was coming to an end so I kind of refocused for the last 20 seconds or so uh, and I mean, I was stunned. And it's one of those great lessons. I'm a guy that thinks I think I have my antenna up. At this time, I, at, at this point, I've been in Washington a lot over the last decade, um, and I and I had no idea. And it's not like we're not paying attention to what's going on. We know that Pete Pace, who's the chairman, is coming up for his second confirmation. All of us think it's basically automatic. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Bush is going to nominate him. What Gates said was, was that a couple things. One, you know, he had gone over to see Levin and McCain. <clears throat> Neither one of them were supportive of Pete's uh, second two years. Uh, and then Gates, you know, came back from that. And one of the things he said was, I, you know, I didn't come to town to throw gas on fires. You know, I came to town, and he'd been there. This is May, so he'd been there since December. Uh, not quite six months, he said, I came to town to put fires out. So all of that, the message, not, not the message, the facts were because of where President Bush was with the Hill, Bush did not have enough uh, uh, credibility, if you will, uh, enough cash in the bank to push pace across the line. Uh, and that then moved them, unbeknownst to me, to make another selection, and, and I became the selection. And, I mean, Bob Gates can speak for himself. This was a wartime, rapid evolution for me. I'd given a speech somewhere, and more than once, 
that basically said, because I'd grown up, particularly in the Navy, on the money side, and the rules are you keep yours and you go get some other services money, uh, what I had learned in war was that the, the U.S. Army is the center of gravity of our military. And if our Army isn't doing well, our military is not doing well, and vice versa. So I gave a speech to that effect. Gates had heard that somewhere. I mean, that kind of got his attention. Uh, and then, who am I, you know, kind of thing. And they obviously did their diligence and thought I'd be a, you know, a good fit. So that's, that, you know, that was that day, and I was shocked. It was literally the night before graduation here. Uh, I said to Gates when he asked me, I said, well, I've been living with this young gal for, you know, 40 years, and we need to have a conversation. So I went home, and Deb and I were driving down here to Annapolis that night to attend a graduation party, and I was trying to figure out how to pop the question to Deb. Uh, and we're about halfway down on 50, and it wasn't going to get better, you know, <laughs> time-wise. <laughs> so I said something. In fact, Gates called me in today, and President Bush wants me to take over as chairman. Well, she, you know, she sucked the air out of the atmosphere for miles. I mean, she was completely shocked. And then she said, well, how are we going to do this? And I looked at her and I said, we're going to do this just like we always do. We're going to do this together. So I went back next, the next morning. Gates lived next to me uh, in the compound across the street, what's called Navy Hill. He lived in a set of quarters on Navy Hill across the street from the State Department. I went back the next morning. I'd gone to the gym. I was in gym gear. I went over and knocked on his door and I could see him clanking around in his kitchen, getting his coffee or stuff like that. He came and I said, glad to do it, you know, a privilege to do it. And, but I also said, I only have one request. He goes, what's that? We had moved five times since 2000. <clears throat> I said, we, we really want to stay in these quarters. He said, I don't care where you live. Boom. So we were in the vice chief's quarters, what is now the vice chief's quarters. The CNO's quarters was shut down because uh, when we came back from Italy, it was full of mold and we needed to fix that. Uh, little did Gates know what he, was, what he said when that happened, because to have the chairman living in a set of Navy quarters and this quarters over at Fort Myer, which was the chairman's quarters, uh, um, which has, as a lot of people say, a great view, but otherwise it's a pretty difficult place to live for lots of reasons that I won't go into here. I mean, it's a nice set of quarters and it's a nice area, but that's the one thing Deb said, and then it turns out, you know, we were able to sustain that over time against a lot of people's objection. Uh, um, and, uh, and this was May, right? Uh, and uh, actually, uh, things like this don't uh, normally uh, not leak. Uh, it literally didn't leak until July. Uh, actually, I was down here at the Naval Academy at the superintendent's change of command. As we were sitting, I, I was sitting up on the stage, and then I could see a lot of people at one point start <laughs> looking down at their then blackberries, you know, what's going on here. And as soon as I could look at mine, I'd gotten a request from a reporter, we're here and you're going to be the next chairman, which I didn't answer. But that's, but again, as secrets go, that one lasted a long time. So like Secretary Gates, you straddled two administrations, yes. a Republican yeah. administration, the Bush administration, into the Obama administration. So as you've already said, you're, you're in the middle of a two-war yeah. environment. One particularly is going poorly. Yeah. And uh, there was this idea, this sort of facile idea that Afghanistan was the good war. Let's focus on that and yeah. um, let's, let's figure out how we can get out of, um, of Iraq. I, when I talk, talk to you about... Um joining the air wing, the GW yes. battle group, and flying. Uh, and again, uh, Admiral Stuffelbeam was, was very gracious to include me, and I will forever appreciate that. In, in a lot of aviation flying, trying to understand. So now I'm chairman years later. I've got two wars. I'm a sailor running two ground wars. Not running, but certainly involved. And so literally I got on a plane the next day after I took over from Pete. I mean, it, and it is one of these lessons of he, he just got in the political crossfire. Did, didn't he align himself, and it's just my perception from, from watching uh, on the media coverage of it, did, did, didn't he overly align himself with Secretary Rumsfeld? And so when Secretary Gates comes aboard, um, as you said, 
maybe that perception with McCain and, and the others, he wasn't going to get uh, renowned. I think it was it the alignment piece with right, Rumsfeld. Gates and Bush decided to renom him. Oh, okay. It was okay. Gates going to the Hill, seeing Republican McCain, Democrat Levin, saying we're not going to push him through. But why so didn't they the, like him? What were their problems with him? They were both, in their own way, in great disagreement for different reasons and in different ways with Bush and the White House and where Iraq was. And, and so Pace was right in the middle of that. And, and you know, that idea of his being nominated got squashed right there. And, okay. and President Bush, who did really want Pete to stay another two years, he did not have enough, this is my judgment, uh, you know, enough credibility on the Hill, enough political capital to overcome the resistance from Levin and McCain okay. without a huge public fight. And whether or not he could have done that without that fight is, is an open question. So it wasn't from Gates or Bush initially. It was really the resistance on the Hill, and it was because of the Iraq War. So anyway, uh, little, I take over as chairman. The next day or a day, the day or two later, I'm on a plane to mm -hmm. Iraq and Afghanistan because now... Not unlike being in the ready rooms and what's going on with you, J.O.s. Now I want to find out what's going on on the ground. Now, I'd been to Iraq, particularly when I was in Naples, looking at corpsmen that were supporting the Marine Corps. This was right after Fallujah in 2004, my first trip. Fallujah 2, actually. And I wanted to know what's going on with sailors, the, the, the medics, the corpsmen, sorry, that were with the Marine Corps. I wanted to see the Seabees, and I also wanted to... Uh, understand, you know, the, the how they were being equipped. Are we getting them what they need? And understand as much as I could what was going on on the ground. But now I'm the chairman. I'm going to be signing orders every single day to send young men and women off to war, some of whom are not coming back, and I want to know as much as I can. So I go there the first of, obviously, dozens of trips over the course of the next four years to those two countries. Uh, Iraq in 07 was in the surge, right? So we'd been through this debate at the end of 2006. I'm the CNO, one of the Joint Chiefs. How many brigades are we going to send? Uh, which was a pretty controversial review. President Bush decides five brigades, we're sending them. Uh, and, you know, I knew all of that, but now I'm in enough. Now they're sent in 2007, uh, and I need to see. Uh, as, understand as much as I can about what's going on, to include spending a lot of time with Petraeus, who, who'd since become a four-star and was running the war on the ground in Iraq. The ground commander was, I think the first one the, in that time frame was Ray Odierno, who eventually became the Army Chief. I think he was relieved by Lloyd Austin. It's the first time I met Lloyd Austin, who's our current Secretary of Defense, as a three-star that handled the ground command issues from, from Mosul to uh, Basra, the entire country. I want to learn a whole lot more about ground warfare, basically, and all the systems. What was in the way of them winning on the ground? I had spent, since I was with you in GW, an inordinate amount of time with SEALs. You may remember we had a, a Gary Richard and Tony Parker, I think, were the two officers that had our SEAL debt on the GW. Bob Harwood was the was the 05 commander in the Gulf in 97. He was the 05 SEAL liaison as as detachments would come in, Harwood would take them off the ship and they'd be off doing stuff. I was infinitely curious about their life uh, as far back as GW. So now, and I've paid attention to what they're doing when Eric Olson was a two-star raising the community and SEAL community in San Diego, he's now the four-star running SOCOM. Uh, they are doing missions to a fairly well when I'm CNO uh, that I am paying attention to because I sat in on Stan McChrystal, his briefing, and Stan's, Stan was the joint guy in Iraq running special forces, and I fundamentally believe changed warfare as much as any single individual in our history. Uh, because of what he did, so I I had already paid a lot of attention to what was going on in the 
in the special operations world. I did that routinely the four years that I was chairman. Uh, it typically, particularly if I went to Afghanistan first, I'd show up at Bagram Air Base, you know, at midnight because that's when they're getting out of the rack to get ready for uh, missions, briefing missions, go out on missions, and I'd watch them uh, until oh dark thirty in the morning. So I knew the commanders. I got to know particularly the Army side. I knew a bunch of those SEALs already, but I got to know the Army commanders, uh, including Rich Clark, who recently retired from SOCOM. You know, when Rich was in 06, I think, 05 or 06. But I made it a point to know these leaders uh, and to understand their operations so that I could better understand decisions that I was making and make better decisions, you know, where I was back as chairman. So I consciously decided, when I was CNO, my calendar, I would spend roughly 25% of my time out of town, uh, out of Washington. Um, traveling either in the country or the world to see the Navy. Uh, my conscious decision as chairman because of these wars was I upped that to 40%. That's a, that's a high risk gamble, quite frankly, because one of the universal rules is you better not miss a meeting. Uh, and if you miss a meeting, something may get decided that you would be strongly opposed to or certainly not even get your, uh, your vote on the table. But because of the wars, that's what I did. Pakistan became target number one for me because as a Vietnam guy, we didn't win in Vietnam because in great part there was there were safe havens in Laos and Cambodia. Well, Pakistan basically was a safe haven for the war in Afghanistan, for the Taliban leadership, for Al-Qaeda, uh, for the entire terrorist organizations, all the terrorist organizations that were and terrorists that were embedded uh, and I needed Pakistan on side, if I could, uh, get to, to, uh, um, uh, to, to get to a point where we possibly could, uh, could win the war. That became a more and more significant effort over time because of other reasons uh, where we didn't win the war. A and it wasn't that we didn't win it because we couldn't execute the ground combat side of it. It was because we didn't we didn't have the political will to do what I believe we needed to do to win that with respect to good governance, rule of law, corruption, economy, et cetera. I, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on this very famous, iconic picture. So this is the Abbottabad raid. Is that the war room? Where, where are you? That's the war room in the White House? The picture itself is actually in an ante room from the Situation Room. This is May 1st in the U.S., May 2nd uh, in Pakistan, in Abbottabad. Uh, and uh, it's a Sunday. Um, we have been planning this. I f was first brought in to the intel side of this in January. Panetta had brought it to Obama, I think, as early as last August, as a, uh, the previous August. But the other thing was, if this leaked, if, if it got out, Bin Laden would have disappeared like that. So I commend an awful lot of people for keeping this shut down for the period of time. Because I had spent a lot of time in the SEAL world, in the soft world, sorry, and I knew the commanders, I knew McRaven well. I knew when he started rehearsing this, which was at the first, uh, at the beginning of the year. I would actually went to the dress rehearsal, you know, in the dead of night, you know, somewhere in America. I met the 50 SEALs or so, 48 or 49 SEALs that were selected for the mission at the end of the rehearsal, looked everyone in the eye, shook their hand, gave them a coin and wanted them to know they had somebody, you know, at the top that cared a lot about what they were doing. And we all pretty much thought, it wasn't a suicide mission, but it was gonna be it was gonna be hugely challenging. But I was pretty I was very comfortable having seen the rehearsal and having been through this with McRaven you know, a lot before even the rehearsal. I had great confidence they could pull it off. And then we'd had the debate, you know, inside the Obama administration about what we we're going to do. We we're going to send a team. Were we going to drop a bomb, a big bomb, a small bomb, et cetera. And, and President Obama, and I give him a lot of credit for this and have for a long time, he made a courageous decision because we had no smoking gun. We didn't know for sure. This was 18 months before his re-election campaign, if you will, or the, the actual uh, uh, 
uh, election date, the voting date, uh, in November of 12. His poll numbers weren't particularly good at the time, and my view is he bet the presidency on this mission. Had it gone south, had he not been there, I think it would have been a real struggle for him for a second term. Obviously, it did go well, uh, not completely well, uh, and this picture captures the, the intensity that was there. My main mission, we go over, I think I went over to the White House about noon on Sunday. Uh, this thing was going to go down several hours later. I don't know, I should know the exact time in the U.S., but it was one or two in the morning that it went down in Pakistan, and we're six or seven hours, I think seven hours behind them. But my main goal at this point now was just to make sure that nobody here in this picture, with the exception of the president, got in the way of the operation. Panetta is commanding this, literally from CIA headquarters, because it's a classified operation. I'm in the big sit room. This is not the big sit room. And people are starting to wander into this ante room, which I'd never been in before, because all our sit room meetings were in the big sit room. Anyway, by the time I'm almost sitting there by myself, saying, well, I'd, I'd better go in there, <laughs> since that obviously people are, are watching this. Just for the record, uh, can we go around the horn? So obviously, Vice President Biden, President Obama, you, who's the Air Force general sitting at the laptop? I don't know. I, for, I, for, I, I knew it then. I've seen him. And then who's, sit, who's standing next to you? This is Tom Donlan, who was a NASA security advisor. This is Bill Daly, who was president's chief of staff. There's, there's Anthony Dennis, Blinken behind him. It's yeah, kind of Anthony interesting. Blinken, now the who Secretary was of State. Vice President Biden's uh, national security advisor. Right. I don't know who this gal is. John Brennan, who was a counterterrorism advisor to the president. Jim Clapper, who was the director of national intelligence. And then you've got Gates, Secretary Clinton, and then Dennis McDonough. Uh, who later was the chief of staff. Later the chief of yeah. staff behind Bill Daley. Um, and he was the deputy national security advisor at the time. So what are, what are we watching? Is this a real-time feed of the mission? Yeah. Yeah, w which, multi camera, which or, I would, or what's the point of view? What what do you what is everybody looking at? You're looking at a satellite stream, quite frankly, overhead of, view, overhead, yeah, okay, of what's going on, which which didn't tell us boo about what went on once they went inside yeah. the comp, once okay. they went inside the building. I went on the Letterman show a couple months later, and Letterman tried to get me the whole time I was on explain what was going on here, what we were looking at, and yeah. I wouldn't say boo about what, because it was very class, obviously highly classified. We're talking in 2023, I think three years ago, I ran into Pete Sousa, who took the picture. He was a he was Obama's photographer, and I knew, I didn't know him well, but I mean, I'd been around Pete a lot, and I ran into him coming back from New York on a, a late train, and I asked him, and we were just catching up, I said, do you, can you timestamp this photo? Uh, because it is iconic, obviously. And he said, I don't know. So he goes back, and he gets back, and he says, I can't. I didn't put a timestamp on it. I will tell you that when I walked in there, the helicopter was already down. The first guy I looked at was Gates, because Gates had been in the sit room for the uh, tragic events associated with uh, Desert One in 1980, for the Iranian hostage rescue, and certainly had some reservations about this operation because, in my view, it's not because he's told me this, but because uh, of what he went through back then. And I just wondered, man, what, me, what must be going on in his head? Uh, that said, that helicopter pilot, in my view, uh, and we talked about the rehearsal, but that helicopter pilot saved the mission. Uh, and because he was able to land that helicopter in that position. Uh, and with all the rehearsals, and there were many, including this dress rehearsal I spoke of, uh, the, it's, it's a reminder that uh, you got to train as hard as you can, uh, and no matter what you do, Murphy shows up. Uh, and in this case, Murphy was in an overheated compound in terms of the air that was available in which to fly once the helicopter got over the wall and it was too hot and he didn't have enough air to keep the helicopter up. Uh, so he managed to essentially land it as many people have seen it. Uh, there was obviously great immediate great concern. Uh, nobody actually in the sit room here uh, other than just sort of holding their breath. And 
uh, McRaven, who was on speaker, uh, uh, said, don't worry about this. We've, had, we've planned for something like this. And while the operation changed about where the helicopters were, where they, you know, once they, how they get into the compound, basically the team executed from that position. Was McRaven in Tampa? Where was he? No, McRaven was in Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, Jalalabad, which is where this hall right. was based out of. Okay. McRaven calmed the concerns and clearly they started to execute. Uh, in my view, it didn't have any immediate impact. That helicopter didn't have any immediate impact on the on the operation because the SEALs exited the helicopter and essentially entered the compound to, to execute the mission. What I would say about that helicopter pilot is I'd met both of them uh, down at Fort Stewart and uh, when you talk to them about their experience level, they're the two lead pilots in this, uh, and I really believe the one saved the mission, had over 6,000 hours in uh, uh, helicopters very similar to the one they were flying. I think it's pretty widely known now that there were special capabilities on these two ca on these two helicopters, but it was the amount of experience that they had that I was so struck by uh, at the time, and I think that experience level, you know, added up to his being able to save the operation. So the operation got executed. Uh, it was it was visible to us sitting in this room until they the seals went into the building, literally into the and, and so for I think I've heard upwards of 20 minutes. We really didn't know what was going on. Uh, after that period of time, we heard Geronimo, which was essentially uh, that we've that we've uh, captured or killed. Uh, bin Laden, the target, uh, and and then there was time that as they tried to strip the compound uh, of as much, uh, we call it pocket litter, but it was bigger than that, the computers, the files, the thumb drives, the papers, uh, which, they, uh, which they put in bags, along with putting Bin Laden's body, you know, in a body bag, and then and, and then getting out of there. And as that was being executed, you could sort of see the town wake up, if you will. You know, a great deal has been made of the fact that this was so close to their military academy. You and I are sitting, you know, on the grounds of the Naval Academy. Yes, it's a military installation, but it's a not it's not a great military force. Uh, and so, <laughs> You know, I, I've just for years have listened to that. How could not? And how how no one could know next to the military academy? It's not like there are a lot of military operational units in the vicinity. That said, they were starting to wake up uh, in terms of uh, uh, what was going on, and we we had we had scoped this operation out to a fairly well. So we knew about how much time we had. Uh, it's one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning there. We actually, it was delayed a day uh, from Saturday night to Sunday night because of, uh, of the, the, the uh, optimum uh, minimum light, if you will, uh, available. Uh, we knew how to get in and out of the airspace. We had, you know, with respect to, we knew, you know, Pakistani, they have a good air force, but they got to know where they're going. They got to know where the target is kind of thing. Um, and and so we knew we had some time, but you want to get out as quickly as you can. So we uh, we had a backup helicopter, which you know I'm uh, very comfortable saying President Obama actually put on put in the plan uh, as we were finalizing the operation. He looked at us and said, "Shouldn't we have a uh, an additional helicopter close by in in case?" something really goes wrong. And I give him great credit for that. We knew we had to refuel the helos going out. We'd set a place to do that, which we did. But it was that backup helicopter that was actually stationed roughly at the refueling area that actually came in to get was the seals. Was that in Pakistan or Afghanistan? I was in Pakistan. Okay. I mean, we're, we're 90, 100 minutes into Pakistan. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. You know, into that country. And kind of a fun story in all this back to this very famous picture, you can see now President Biden, then Vice President Biden, sitting in front of President Obama. Uh, and uh, as this operation 
we, we knew we'd killed him, but we're packing up to get out. And I look down, and I see Vice President Biden. He and I both carry rosary rings. Um, and uh, I had one in my pocket, and I'd carried it for a long time. And I looked down, I didn't know, I didn't know that uh, Vice President Biden did, but I, I looked down at him, and I see a rosary ring in his hand, and he's reaching in his pocket, in his back pocket, to take his wallet out, take the rosary ring off, and stick it in his wallet. And I leaned over from that position, and I said, Mr. Vice President, I got 50 special force operators illegally in a country. I've just killed the number one terrorist in the world. I got to fly back out for an hour and a half through enemy airspace, identify him, put him on uh, an Osprey, fly back, fly out again through Pakistani airspace, get him to a carrier, and give him the proper burial. Would you please put that ring back in your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. So that was, you know, that, I mean, that was the operation. There's a lot more associated with it. But when people ask me about the, what was the highlight of your chairman's job, it was really that. It was, it was essentially to um, really get to, you know, proper justice for the guy that led 9-11 and killed so many Americans. But we did have a reasonable discussion about, okay, uh, there, there was a planning book for the White House on who was going to call who. Who's going to call President Zadari? Who's going to call this official or that official once this thing got executed? And I know President Obama called both President Clinton and President Bush uh, in, in terms of letting them know. Uh, but there was some debate about who was going to call General Kiani. Again, the most powerful guy in the country. He's the head military guy. I had a long-standing relationship with him. But this was a country that no matter how much we wish them to be a democracy run with civilian control of the military, it wasn't the case. And for the several years that I had been in and out of there, every political leader coming from the U.S., they'd go see the president, who was whoever it was, wasn't overly effective, but they all wanted to see General Kiani. So it was like when we visited, we'd reinforce the idea that he's in charge. That was true when he visited me here as well in a counterpart visit. So we had this debate about who was going to call him. In the end, the decision was made that I would call him. I had the relationship. And I can remember getting him on the phone, uh, and it was, roughly, uh, it was roughly one or two in the morning. Uh, and he, the first thing he said to me, he says, I understand there's some good news. Uh, and, uh, and I went through what had happened. Uh, and then we talked about it. You know, we talked about what had happened and what, what I knew at that point in time. Uh, and, uh, and then he said, well, are you going to, is the president going to talk? Are you going to announce it to the world? And I said, well, that hasn't been decided yet because it really hadn't. And he said, look, you know, the people are coming awake here. It's all over Twitter at this point. Something big has happened. Uh, people are starting to figure it out and find out. You know, I, Kiani said, I really need your president to tell the world what happened, and then I'll deal with it from that standpoint, from that on. So I took that back, and that, that there was someone else on the call that was listening, so we took that back to the president. Uh, and that was a part of the decision to go out that night, which the president did, and, and tell the world what had happened. Uh, uh, which I thought, again, was a, was a smart decision. As I was leaving later on, maybe an hour or two later, maybe one in the morning, our time, local, uh, uh, I was walking by myself by the Rose Garden, uh, and I hear these chants coming out of Lafayette Square, and it's USA, USA, and there's many, many young voices in that. And, and the White House isn't that far from George Washington University and a lot of other young people. And I, and I, the, the chance really struck me, and it's now, uh, again, I, it's in my head, I finally have sort of wound down, uh, and I saw, uh, and, and, and that was when it really sort of struck me, I mean, literally in that moment, what we'd done, um, and, uh, and the next morning I saw a couple young students from one of the local universities interviewed on one of the Good Morning shows. Uh, and I was reminded, and they were saying how significant this was to them, and I was reminded, this is 2011, so 2001, they're nine or ten years old, and I was reminded 
when I listen to them, how significant 9-11 was to them in their lives as 9 or 10 year olds, as demonstrated or as reflected in what they were saying now in terms of the justice piece and the change in the country and all of that. And I was trying to think about when that hit me the next morning, I'm trying to, well, when I was 9 or 10, I'm looking for my baseball glove. I'm trying to get to the Little League field. My sphere of uh, situational awareness is, you know, 100 yards, if that. Uh, and and it, was a re- it was just a reminder of how big a deal, you know, this, this really was. That kind of closure, the justice piece uh, to somebody who, you know, had killed so many Americans. That said, in the category of the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, it was 10 weeks later that that, that helicopter was shot down in Afghanistan. We lost 38 troops. Uh, nine of those were Afghan soldiers. The rest were special forces. Uh, and, you know, a week or two after that, uh, you know, I was burying 13 SEALs in Arlington National Cemetery. And so it is a reminder of you know, the the highs and the lows when you're at war. Um, and, and so that was a very significant time, uh, obviously, in my life, in my wife's life, you know, in America's life, and certainly for the special force community that had such a significant loss. And part of that was, uh, we, we Deb and I had made many trips to Dover to, to witness the distinguished transfer uh, of the bodies of those who were killed in in Afghanistan or Iraq, to meet with the families if they would do that. Uh, and, and and we had been to many funerals at Arlington. In fact, Deb would go weekly to a funeral in Arlington. I would try to go as often as I could to put a face uh, and a name on this huge military complex uh, that their son or daughter served for, served with uh, in serving the country and lost their lives and and paid the ultimate price uh, and this for me was vietnam i mean that was the last thing in the world anybody wanted to see was more publicity about what the real cost of war is and i saw it i saw it all the time deb saw it all the time with these families these young widows who were 19 years old with two kids uh, and so we really did try to 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 give it uh, a very much a, a live face and have a conversation with those families in their in in these extreme moments uh, of grief uh, and to give President Obama credit uh, we went to the dignified transfer for these 38 uh, individuals who passed away who were killed in that helicopter shoot down uh, 250 or so family members there and the president met with every single one of them. In fact, there was a family of, I think, two or three that got there late. And of course, if you can imagine the President of the United States, the staff is trying to, they, they, there was some reluctance on the part of his staff to have him go and spend that much time in the first place. That's a lot of time for the president, any president. But this one family showed up late, didn't get to see the president on the front end before the ceremonies. Uh, and uh, and somehow the president got wind of this, and as his staff was, let's get out of here, he got wind of it and said, no, I want to go see that family. So he saw every single family member. And there were two, and Deb and I were also engaged with the families, and there were two women there that I'll remember the rest of my life. One was a wife, spouse, and one was a mother. Separately, two separate conversations of two of, the, two of those had, who had lost. Both of them said, you know, my son or my husband would have gotten on that helicopter if he had known it was going to be his last mission. That's the American military man and woman. That, that's who we were blessed to serve with and lead, you know, at an incredibly difficult, challenging time for the country. And it was a great privilege to be able to do that. Uh, so, as you mentioned, General Dempsey relieves you a few months, weeks later? This, the... Well, October 1st okay. or maybe September 30th. Uh, and um, and this was May, so five months later, Dempsey took over. Um, so that brings to a close 45 years, if I'm doing the math right, of 43. 43. So that brings to a close 43 years <laughs> yeah. of military service. Active duty, yeah. Active duty service. Obviously, yeah. uh, right. we'll talk about your post yeah. 
uh, Navy life, which is, uh, by your own admission, busier than ever. Let, let's handicap each war uh, in individually. So talk about the war, of, the war in Iraq. First, the initial invasion, because I will tell you, I was touring in support of Punk's war, and people kept saying Iraq, and I was going, you mean Afghanistan? They're like, no, no, Iraq. We're, it's sort of like six months out. They were like, no, no, we're going to invade. And, and I'm thinking, when you and I were there, that country was kind of at parade rest when we were doing Operation Southern Watch. We knew where everybody was. You know, occasionally a, a MiG might try to go after a NATO U-2 or UN U-2. As you mentioned, the hostilities peaked after we left, right? So Desert Storm, or Desert Fox, rather, that Enterprise did was really our plan that they executed. Right, right. But that was it. That was really just sort of a little bit of a punctuation on the, on the whole situation. So I was, I was a little bit, I didn't see the imminent piece. Now, I know you knew General Powell very well, Secretary Powell very well. So what was your opinion of the initial invasion let me ask that in first. 03. In 03. So l let me back it up a second. Because the question about war is, is critical and enduring. And one of the things I talk about, and it goes back to my first deployment, it goes back to when I, we talked about being a midshipman here, what happened in 1968. So the first war for me was Vietnam. Uh, and there were lots of lessons associated with that. Uh, when, we, when we invaded Iraq, uh, I'm a three-star, uh, on the on the CNO staff, I'm the the uh, the budget guy, if you will, uh, for the CNO. Soon to transition to be the vice chief, uh, and uh, and the first thought I had, I had two thoughts. One is, will the American people blame the United States military because that was my experience in Vietnam? Uh, and secondly, will we generate a group of homeless vets as we did after Vietnam. I literally, those, the clarity of those thoughts initially uh, uh, stick with me literally to this day. And over the course of the next two years or so for me, which is when I moved to be the vice chief, then I go to Europe, and then I'm, uh, uh, and then I'm the CNO, the first question got answered, meaning the American people were able to separate the policy from the people because they were incredibly supportive of our military. The second question about vets, the, the answer was yes. And in fact, while homeless vets in particular, in fact, while Vietnam, the homeless vet population generally didn't show up until about 10 years after the war ended, it started showing up in pretty significant numbers four years in. So 2007, 2008, and I spent a lot, and Deb and I have spent a lot of time on active duty, on wounded warriors, uh, families of the fallen, and, uh, um, uh, and, and veterans, but particularly uh, those groups. And then I've just transitioned in my, in my private life since I retired. Uh, instead of focusing on military and the families, we focus on veterans and their families with our, a lot of our private uh, efforts. Um, so the Vietnam backdrop, for me, as we're in these wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, was huge. And I wear scars from Vietnam, I think, as everybody that was involved in those wars does, one way or another. And it affected me greatly when I got into these positions of leadership, which I certainly wasn't planning on. Uh, not, I, I already talked about one. I wanted the American people to see what the the carnage and the loss was from these wars as much as possible. I believe in our democracy. I believe if the American people see that, they will vote yes or no, that we will keep doing this. I didn't want to hide it from them. And I thought every family that lost anybody deserved that. So I wasn't shy about being very public. Uh, back to my dad, who was a public relations guy, uh, he, knew, he knew how to coin a phrase. Uh, I learned early about the value of the press, uh, that freedom of the press. And I felt very comfortable with the press the whole time. Uh, and so I, I would engage them on the significant issues uh, of the day. So that aspect of the war, if you will, we, we were in Afghanistan as of 2001. Literally, I think the first strikes were within a, within a month. They were October. 
uh, of 2011 or so. Yeah, October 7th. Yeah. Now, I wasn't, I'm a three star on the Navy staff handling the money. I think I told you, I got there and a week later, 9 11 occurred. Uh, and, uh, and so we're all focused on that. I am not privy, even as a senior officer like that, to the war plans at all. That was handled at a very high level, very, this was Rumsfeld and Fife and Wolfowitz uh, and Cambone and Jim Haynes, that, that group in the Pentagon, if you will. Uh, and I wasn't privy to that planning. Obviously the chiefs were, uh, Admiral Clark was one of the chiefs uh, that was involved in that planning. And then the decision was to execute. And the issue uh, I think you're talking about uh, was, you know, then Secretary of State Powell and his testimony, uh, which, uh, which from my point of view, I think from everybody's point of view, sort of put the evidence over the top in a way that, that there was an open path to be able to invade. And generally speaking, the American people were supportive at that time. I would argue we didn't have much of a debate about it in the country. And that's a big lesson learned. That's one of the things I've learned over time. Uh, uh, and we have to have something because war is the most serious thing we do. Uh, and, and it's the most consequential decision any president makes, or the country, quite frankly, particularly because of the lives that are at risk and eventually get lost in war. Uh, that lesson is you got to get that decision right. And I've struggled since that time with how do you do that? Uh, and uh, and my answer, my, uh, one answer to that is, what, you got to have the debate. The question is, how do you generate the debate? And I've said publicly for years, I'll re-say it here, uh, when we are in a position to go to war again, and I never want to be, but sadly the, the parametric data is pretty compelling that it's not going to go away. Uh, I want, uh, I don't agree with what Bob Gates said at one point in time, the next president or the next secretary of defense would be crazy to put 100,000 people somewhere. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I get that. I get the, the, the thought process. But we have been perfectly, we're batting 0, 0, 0 since Grenada in 1983 predicting where we'd go to war. We haven't got one right yet. And the point is that not very likely will predict the next one either. And you need to be ready for it. And I would argue that we should make our army notionally 100,000 smaller. They're about 485,000. Uh, uh, and have, ha have it be big enough as a deploying force, which the army essentially became, you know, in Iraq. Uh, and they are now a deploying force where we could send 100,000 these wars don't last three months or so, as was originally thought to be the case in Iraq. They're more like 10 years at a crack. We could put 100,000 soldiers somewhere, but we couldn't relieve them. And that would cause us to come, and, and this math isn't exactly right, but that would cause us to call up about a half a million 18-year-olds in a draft to support the war. And I want the debate about whether we go to war or not centered on that discussion and at the, at the dinner table of every family who's got an 18-year-old son or daughter that might get called up. And then we have the debate at, through the political system that we have uh, and the decision gets made to go or not go. Uh, and, if it, and if it's a go, uh, there are a lot of issues associated with what I'm just suggesting. There are readiness issues, there are, there are training issues, there's, we're the most combat experienced as we speak today force in our history. Uh, that said, I worry that we move, we're moving further and further away from the American people. We're smaller than, we're less than 1%. We come from fewer and fewer places. We're physically in fewer and fewer places in the country. So we're not coaching, teaching, we're not in the churches, the neighborhoods like we used to be. So the American people don't know us like they used to know us. Uh, and, and that's a worry. I worry, I've said for years, it's almost like we're the French Foreign Legion. You know, go off, fight our dirty little wars, we'll pay you, your compensation will be okay. And it is pretty good these days. Uh, but, you know, take care of it for me. That, that's a recipe for disastr uh, in, 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 for 
the war wherever that happens as well as the country long term. Now if we can have that debate by other means, if leadership could bring this debate on, then I can have a discussion about the draft uh, as I described it. Though the draft is a uh, you know, it, is, uh, it, it comes at you on an equal basis. Everybody goes. Uh, I, I mean, people from all kinds of backgrounds, young people, are drafted. And I think that's a much better, uh, that's a much better uh, force, mix, force mix, if you will. So that's one of the specters of Vietnam. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. I remember very, no, I, yeah. very well. I mean, I transitioned, you know, in that time. I was, yeah. I was in... Bef you know, during the draft, and then transition yes. in the '70s out of the draft. Um, so I remember the older brothers of my friends freaking out, yeah. and you know, families feeling the tension. I don't know if I knew anyone since we lived in military communities who went to Canada or anything like that. But the calculus, the national discussion, people's feelings about the existence of a war was a lot more intense, forged. Yeah by the existence of the draft. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a political will currently for the reasons you just laid out. We're, I don't know how you get there from here uh, politically. Um, so we toppled Saddam. This is a facile bit of foreign policy, but that unleashed sectarian violence that was yeah. kept under yeah. a lid in his regime. And some would say that empowered Iran yeah. to now become a, a stronger power. So how does that war net out? I don't believe it was a good decision. I don't believe it was worth it. Um, and uh, the individuals who were involved in that, it, there's two aspects of the decision to go in the first place, which was based on bad intel. And that's a very strong message. That's of getting it right. Um, uh, and for those of us in the military who, who work in that political world, and I'll put Colin in that uh, world as well, obviously as a national security advisor, as the chairman, and obviously as secretary of state, where he came back to serve again. And he's one of my mentors and a good friend and the guy that I, you know, I, I've thought the world of, you know, forever. But even Colin Powell, sort of the statesman, soldier statesman of our time, got caught in that uh, political world and essentially was misguided by the intel that was there to, uh, and, and because he had so much credibility, you know, he became sort of the centerpiece for the administration on, yes, this is, we need to go do this. Uh, and that's all, and I had, we had our, in my time, which was obviously later, uh, as I, when I served as chairman, we had senior officers who were involved in the political world uh, that very much, it's a challenging world because it's not our world. We don't grow up in it. Too many times it's difficult to understand the reality of that world when you haven't grown up on it, in it. And I was, you know, I lived in it for four years as chairman, uh, uh, as, as have others. Uh, and there were those, certainly of my colleagues, who struggled uh, you know, in that world as well. Um, my own my own view of that is uh, this was an administration president that wanted to go to war in Iraq, uh, found a reason to do it, and they did two things. What one, it was very poorly thought through in terms of doing it, uh, that the decision, and then equally poorly uh, executed. Uh, and so the civilian leadership once we got into the war was terrible. Bremer, who was the civilian uh, in charge of what I, what I think was called the CPA, Coalition Provision Authority, uh, he was a civilian that was in control on the ground, and his firing of the entire Iraqi military and all the Ba'athists basically underpinned the insurgency which turned weeks or months later. Fundamental, critical mistake, uh, specifically. Uh, secondly, we didn't know much about Iraq. We did, they were, they were contained. There's no question Sodom was contained. Sodom's a bad guy. Uh, but we didn't know much about the region. Um, I can remember, I don't know, a month or two in, I came home one night, and again, I'm the budget guy. I came home one night, and Deb is pouring through Tom Friedman's book, Beirut to Jerusalem. And she looks at me, and she goes, has anybody read this book? Too often... 
we find ourselves in places trying to figure it out as we go in stride as opposed to really work our way through it. Uh, so I thought it was a mis I didn't think at the time, I didn't know enough to, at the time to know how much of a, a mistake it was, but in, certainly in retrospect, I think it was. And, and it's a little befuddling when you consider the 80s, then we're supporting Iraq against Iran uh, as well. But uh, uh, that's, that's kind of where we were. And then my time as chairman, essentially we set the calendar to get out in 2011. Uh, and I went through all of that with uh, uh, President Bush, and I would give him a lot of credit for this. And he did this in several visible areas to me, where he would leave the decision to the next president, whoever it was going to be, because it was going to be a big decision. So we set the clock in 2011 to give the next president enough time to make a decision about what, what he or she wanted to do. Uh, this, was, this was well before the election, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, our election in, uh, in 2008. And, and President Obama had committed to leaving, and there's similarities, in my view, between President Obama saying we're all out of Iraq and President Biden saying we're all out of Afghanistan. They campaigned on that, and uh, it became pretty obvious to me in the, you know, in the not, not after too many meetings that we were coming out completely. It was just the path uh, that, that, uh, that the answer that we're, of leaving forces in Iraq was going to be zero. Uh, and there was, certain, there, there was a lot associated with that, including the political commitment to, you know, to get out. All of that said, the, you know, the losses that we have incurred were extraordinary, certainly for us in the military, as well as the Iraqi people and the carnage. Uh, and something else I learned, you know, as a, as a sailor, uh, uh, but not just as a sailor, I was on the ground so much in both those wars that I wanted, one of the things, I wanted people to understand the carnage that warfare generates, the carnage on the ground. The whole issue of collateral damage, the the idea that we're now in a this is we're way beyond the line of departure piece here. It's a 360 degree war. That's brought to us by the IED fight, just as an example, uh, and the sort of human suicide bombings that would take place, uh, the, you know, throughout the theaters. Quite frankly, some more vulnerable than others, but certainly uh, always there. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm not sure, and we, we, didn't, we didn't really understand all of that, you know, as we entered. We didn't, I mentioned this earlier, I think, where we didn't get it right, in particular in Iraq or Afghanistan. It wasn't the fighting, quite frankly. It was the other stuff. If I had to choose a platform to sit on, I only had, or stand, I only had one, and I went into a country like that, it would be the rule of law. We need to have a rule of law here, and neither country had it. Both countries, in, including the regimes, were incredibly corrupt. Uh, they fundamentally had no governance structure, um, uh, and, uh, and, and their economy, particularly in Afghanistan, which had been devastated by 30 years of war by the time we went in, uh, there was great potential there, but we could never get to it. It all became about the fighting, and politically could we get in and could we get out. Uh, particularly in Afghanistan. So, uh, so, so you learn a lot when you go through all these kinds of things, and hopefully we won't, we won't ignore the lessons. In my view, we ignored the lessons of Vietnam when we went in to Afghanistan and Iraq. And some of that is our hubris, some of it's the American way, meaning, okay, it's my turn, I can figure this out, I don't need to revisit that the lessons there, which is dead wrong, we do need to revisit that as an example. We do need to understand the history. We do need to understand the culture of the people that live in these countries. And all that's got to be fully integrated into, into that decision. It's the most consequential decision in the country. So Afghanistan, obviously we go in there because of 9-11. The presence of al-Qaeda yeah. gave the Taliban every opportunity to, uh, you know, get them out of there. They, they chose not to. Uh, and so we, we, we step off that line of departure in a, a very proportional way. Yeah. Right. Special operators on horseback, yeah. surgical strikes. Uh, I think, and check me on this, I think where Afghanistan now became a long war is when we conflated al-Qaeda with the Taliban. 
and now it's a single enemy. Uh, and so now you really are de facto a nation building if you're going to unseat the Taliban. Um, you mentioned that there it was analogous between how Obama got out of Iraq and how Biden got out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah. I think the only thing that's different is the velocity with which it happened. Yeah. Uh, obviously, President Biden has been roundly criticized for how he did that, most acutely around Abigail and the 13 yeah. service members, not to mention the hundreds of Afghans who were killed in that suicide bombing. Uh, so let me ask you the same question. How does that net out in terms of the legacy of our 20 years of presence there? Well, I think it was, I think it's been pretty well documented. It's through, you know, how many presidencies, uh, you know, one, two, three administrations, uh, certainly uh, in, uh, or four administrations uh, with respect to Afghanistan. And part of the challenge was, and this is as I took over in 2007, I testified in December that year in front of Ike Skelton in the Senate, uh, the House Armed Services Committee, and he asked me about uh, the two wars, and my comment was something along the lines, or my response was something along the lines, uh, it, you know, in Afghanistan we do what we can, in Iraq we do what we must. Because we were starving Afghanistan at the time. Uh, we had focused on Afghanistan in 2001, we got that about right, uh, Taliban were gone, we chased bin Laden, obviously that search was, was uh, starting, but then, you know, we, my view is we took our eye off the ball uh, and went to Iraq, and that distracted us, and that allowed the Taliban eventually to come back. We didn't have what I would call this fulsome plan for, okay, and we had this big debate about nation building or not, uh, and how do we do this, and we grew and grew and grew as a threat uh, grew as well, and as a level of corruption grew, and we were dealing with Karzai, President Karzai and his family, enormously corrupt. Uh, we never had any specifics on the president himself, but his family was enormously corrupt. We knew that. Clearly, and I mentioned early in our discussion here about the, the, uh, the safe zone, you know, the sanctuary in Pakistan for the al-Qaeda and for the Taliban leadership, uh, which, uh, which they had. So it became a much more difficult war the second, you know, that sort of the, after the initial phase. Uh, clearly, al-Qaeda was there. They were public enemy number one. They're the ones that we really wanted. Um, but there is this culture piece of what, what is called Pashtun Wali, where if a guest shows up, you take care of them, no matter who it is. And clearly, the Taliban were taking care of al-Qaeda. And what, what uh, may not be known as well as, uh, as uh, uh, it should be is that Hindu Kush, that border up there, which is Pashtun country, it's 26 million people on both sides of the border, uh, and they almost don't recognize the border. They're families, basically, living on both sides of that. That's, again, part of the history and the culture and how are we going to deal with this, <clears throat> which we ought to understand a whole lot better before we jump in. Uh, so that, too, got dragged out. The war got dragged out the political will to fight it, the resources to fight it, the, the, uh, the, the you know, you've, you've got the watch but I've got the time kind of thing that where they could, uh, they could outweigh us. You know, when I got started to get heavily into Pakistan, um, I had my uh, a group that worked for me that did a lot of studies, you know, in-depth review of certain issues. So I asked the leader of that, I said, go tell me what Pakistan's strategy here is, will you? And take, take what's been executed for the last 10 years and just say, okay, they did this, this must be their strategy, and tell me what it is. They came back to me three or four months later, and essentially the discussion ended with the title of the brief. They, they played me as General Kiani, and in Pakistan the three-star three -star corps commanders run the show. They run the country, basically. And the briefers were going to be the three-star three uh, uh, corps commanders. Uh, and the title of the brief was The Fourth Betrayal. Because in Pakistan, we, didn't, we weren't with them in 65. We weren't with them in 71. We left in 89, in Afghanistan then. And they were just waiting for us to leave again. And what's happened? We left again. Um, and, and so there was that. That's some of what we were obviously engaged in. Uh, in Afghanistan. And then specifically, back to, you know, uh, then Vice President Biden was less than supportive, if you will, of, 
of additional forces in Afghanistan. That's not to say no forces, but certainly his position, as was articulated in many meetings, you know, uh, in the Situation Room, uh, that's where he was. And, uh, and so when he became president, I wasn't surprised that, it, you know, there became, you know, a pretty significant, pretty quick move to get out, and particularly because he'd campaigned on it. And I was sort of, you know, trained by the Obama campaign, which was we're getting out of Iraq. So I wasn't surprised. I thought the way we did it was awful, quite frankly. It was every bit the disaster that it's been played out to be. That said, in a way, it was also classic us. We moved 124,000 people out of there in like 10 days. You know, it was an extraordinary logistics and humanitarian effort. Uh, so there was an upside to it. The problem is we left about that many more who wanted to come out at the time. Uh, the commanders on the ground, I think it's pretty well known that, that the, the, the advice from both Secretary Austin and General Milley was to not leave like that, was to leave a force on the ground, relatively small. That force on the ground felt, the commanders thought that they could contain, if you will, that they could provide the kind of support to the Afghan forces that they needed. But I thought, I actually believe it was all set uh, in motion, you know, when, when not President Biden, but President Trump signed a deal with the Taliban in February of the year before that essentially cinched it. So people criticize the Afghans for, for switching sides, if you will, or uh, the Afghan military in particular, uh, and actually military and police, were the, which are the two big forces. They saw this coming. You know, they knew that the U.S. was leaving, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to survive, and that's, and and they they got out of the way of the Taliban. So, uh, which was a pretty sad ending for, you know, having been there twenty plus years and leaving a country which is I don't know if it's the poorest in the country in the world, but it's pretty close. The GDP used to run I think the, the n number two from the bottom in the world. Uh, leaving a country after that period of time with that investment. Uh, in in much worse shape than uh, than they were, but it's it's also it's the price of war. It's the you, you need to be we need to be mindful of that. There's a huge cost associated with that, and of cost of you know of uh, of not just treasure, but a cost of blood and families that will remember that forever. So uh, you know, and Deb and I, I we we ache for those families. We still. Uh, we're still involved with Gold Star families, you know, um, from every war, but certainly with a significant emphasis uh, on um, uh, families that lost during those two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. You mentioned earlier that you're teaching a leadership course to yeah. firsties, to seniors here. Uh, what's your message to them overall when you think of your 43 years of service? They're going to be okay. Uh, what's fun about firsties particularly first semester, is it's getting real. In a few months, they're going to get commissioned, uh, and it's very sobering to have that conversation with them, that they're, going to, that they're well prepared, that it's a, essentially I, I, the centerpiece of this course is to have them create uh, a framework in which to make decisions. And that framework is based on values, their values, what are they, their beliefs, what do you believe in, if you will, uh, and then the principles, what, what guides you, do you trust people, what's your risk profile, uh, will you delegate, are you a micromanager, um, do you have a bias for action, uh, do you know anything about your troops, uh, and, and a bunch of these mids, and this is the fifth year I've taught here, they're going to be in charge of troops, particularly the Marines, who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq and could have some challenges associated with that. We emphasize, and rightfully so, how do I figure out the, the chief and the gunny, if you will? What's the relationship? Uh, and, uh, and so we talk about that as well. Is that somebody you let, you need, they're magical people, that you need to let them teach you until the moment where, and you'll experience it, where it sort of flips over, don't need that anymore, per se. And, and obviously, you know, we talk about the wars that have been, what does that mean, the future, and the future has changed dramatically. I mean, we're at a point now where we're out of these wars for the last 20 plus years, and it's almost like we're in a new Cold War with China. Uh, and the strategic shift for me is ground wars 
uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan obviously involved the, the, uh, the Army and the Marine Corps. And counter to what the Marine Corps has always felt, if I have a big ground force in a ground war, I'll just become the second army and it'll be existential. The Marines were brilliant in these wars, uh, and that didn't happen. But the Marines have now shifted back to sea, as they should be, uh, as they should. And the threat in the 21st century uh, is really China. Uh, and it is, uh, that is a, an air force, an air campaign, and a naval campaign. Doesn't mean there won't be any part of it that would be uh, involve ground forces, but we're not, my own view is, I don't see us ever, you know, uh, putting any kind of significant ground forces ashore in China. That's just not going to happen. So the strategic shift is to the Navy and to the Air Force, and the building and the town and the country all need to focus on that to be, become the deterrent to make sure we never go to war with China. I know that you've been very public about advising retired officers to stay out of politics. Again, we're just talking about what your advice is to future naval officers. Um, do you ever, or are you ever asked about the, polit the politics piece when you're in those forums? Uh, and uh, you say they're going to be okay. Are we going to be okay going forward here? Well, I I'm hugely concerned about the future of our democracy for, because of what's happened in the last several years. The political division has just taken on an acceleration to the extremes, uh, and I think that's potentially uh, devastating to the future of our country. Um, uh, we need, the military needs to stay out of it. In fact, this goes back to Vietnam, where the military was blamed for the wars. Um, and we built ourselves back up. Uh, and when I'm asked about the bin Laden kill, my response is generally that was the result of an effort. Yes, it was special forces, but our military was, has grown to be exceptional in its professionalism and in its execution. And so that event actually highlighted for me the rebuild over decades uh, uh, from Vietnam, getting out of the hole that we were in back then, and I don't want to lose that. In recent polls, or recent surveys, you've seen the trust uh, on the part of the American people uh, with respect to the military, with the institution, has gone down. It's still very high, but it's no longer, we're no longer at the top, and I think that's part of, partly a result of the political division that's here and the politicization of the military in these very difficult and challenging times, political times for sure. There's a lot at stake here for us as a military and for us as a country. Uh, and uh, I've said for years, you and I have visited countries where the military was completely politicized and we would never want to live in any of those countries. This is the country I want to live in. Uh, and so we need to be very careful about that. And my position on that is, those who are former military, in particular former military officers, uh, should uh, virtually act like they were still wearing the uniform on active duty because we don't talk about political issues or policy that we disagree with publicly when we're in active duty. But I carry it to, to uh, uh, even in the, in the private domain after we retire. It doesn't mean you don't have the right to do it, but I think it damages the institution that you care so much about. Uh, the United States military, uh, with the exception of those who decide to have a, a political career. So I would encourage veterans, those who've served, to get into politics uh, because we need good people to do that. Uh, and my own view is we have fewer and fewer high quality people in that arena uh, over time. And we need, and we've got some great Iraq Afghanistan vets who, who, who have become. Uh, 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 literally, I, mostly uh, representatives in the House, but oftentimes that'll parlay itself into being a senator. I think that's absolutely critical for the future of the country and for, uh, for our military. That said, if it's not that, if you're not a politician, uh, I, uh, my strong belief is and recommendation is stay out of politics publicly because the American people when they see you interviewed, they, they don't, they, 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 your commander you know, Ward Carroll, and you're an expert almost by definition, uh, whether you're uh, active duty or retired. Uh, and, uh, and, and so 
too, there are too many quote-unquote experts on both sides of the aisle on uh, on you know cable in particular that get interviewed as experts and many of them are getting paid which is that much more uh, uh, significant from my point of view to criticize the institution the policy that the institution they care about has to carry out and that they carried out when they were on active duty I think that damages us as an institution in the military and it does great damage to the country so I've encouraged people for a long time, you know, to stay out of politics. Flynn and Allen got away, but believe me, I was critical, I am critical of both of them. They both know that. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they decided to do it. They're not the only ones, but, the, you know, they certainly are the leading examples. And yet, there were previous presidential conventions uh, in both parties where you'd line up a, a half a dozen retired military off flags you know, on the podium to make speeches. We talked about John Nathman, who I got a lot of time for. Nathman was, you know, has been on the stage of a couple conventions himself, uh, again, on both sides. What I don't have is the data that anything like that ever converts to uh, helping someone win a nomination uh, uh, or an election, quite frankly. Uh, so we just, we really have to, I believe we really have to be careful with that. There were, I don't know, a dozen of us or so last year that essentially published this letter on principles for civilian-military uh, relationships. I didn't really understand, Mooch, how challenging and difficult and complex those are when I was executing them, particularly in the chairman's role, which I did for four years there. Uh, I, teach a I taught for six years up at Princeton, and we focused on Civ Mill. Uh, I included in the discussion with the young uh, future officers here uh, at the Naval Academy. Uh, it's enormously complex. Uh, in fact, next week, uh, or I take it back, uh, in fact, tomorrow, uh, a significant part of the class is about Civ Mill. It's a real delicate balance. Uh, and the politicals, many of them, <clears throat> would on will only stop at the limits you create, and we need to have we, we need to say, that's not okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm not going to do that. So as we speak right now, we're in the middle of this drill with Senator Tuberville holding up confirmations of over 300 uh, flag officers. And if it continues, the estimate is that will be closer to 600 or plus by the end of the year, calendar year. And it's somewhere of 80% of our flag community. It's an incredible disruption to our military, to our readiness, to our families, to spouses that are trying to get jobs or, or, or relocate to kids getting into school, personal expenses that you have to pay. Uh, and it's a disservice to those who sacrificed so much, many of whom fought in these wars that we were just talking about. Uh, Senator Tuberville, any senator, any politician, have the debate about the political issue of abortion. I, I don't have a problem with that. Just don't, on the one hand, say the worst thing we can have is a military that's politicized, which Tuberville has written in an op-ed, while he politicizes uh, our military. You know, hypocrisy is not new in Washington, D.C., but it's very visible, and it really is hurting us right now. What we need to do, in my view, in current times, on these issues uh, involving, you know, uh, the, the, the social issues in particular. This is diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, it's race, uh, it's CRT, it's whatever woke is, and I haven't really figured that out. What the politicians need to do, in my view, is the Democrats need to take a position where, as they advocate for many of these issues, that the civilian leaders the political appointees become the advocates, that they don't ask those in uniform to publicly come out and support them. And what the Republicans need to do is not continue to focus on damaging our military, attacking our military leaders. We need to kind of have a ceasefire on all that. And the political leaders on both sides need to to lead us forward and keep us out of it. It is the quintessential 
very timely example right now of what's going on in terms of damaging our military, whether it's Tuberville, specifically on this, uh, on this flag issue, uh, or those who would put us out in front and speak for them on the Democratic side, which is very challenging, and those that would attack us uh, because we're supporting them on these issues from the Republican side. And the country's going to pay a big price for this. Well, you and I know we hosted many congressional junkets uh, when, when you were the bat crew. And uh, generally, I would be hosting these uh, professional staffers, the, the other folks that would come on kind of with this cynical point of view. We'd put the cranial and the float coat on them, let them stand by the foul line and mm. launch a Tomcat. Mm. And they were believers. Uh, I think that, that would do a lot of those lawmakers And a good. hornet. And a, 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 sure, there was, we had some horns, yeah, there was, <laughs> it just wasn't quite as impressive as an F-14B on Cat 3. Well, Admiral Mike Mullen, your mentorship and friendship has been a gift all these years. Thank you for spending a few hours with us today, and I look forward to teeing it up with you again very soon. Thanks, Mooch. Great to be with you.